Good morning. At this time, will all sergeants please start their recordings? You see recording good. Live recording good. Backups is rolling. Live stream is rolling. And Sergeant Sadowski, with your opening statement, please. Mm -hmm. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Education. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair Traeger. We are ready to begin. Okay, good morning and welcome to today's virtual education committee hearing um, on the impact of COVID-19 on student learning and academic achievement. I am Mark Traeger, chair of the education committee. Since May, uh, this committee has exclusively focused on COVID-19's impact on our education system. We focused our efforts on areas of the pandemic's uh, impact with each hearing leading to this one. We looked at the switch to remote learning last spring. We examined the delay to the 2020-2021 school year. Uh, we focused on the overall health and safety of, re of reopening our school system. We looked at the impact on students with disabilities. We held a hearing on social emotional learning and support staff in schools. And we looked at the impact of the pandemic on childcare in New York City. Each hearing led to today, the impact of COVID-19 on student learning and academic achievement. Each hearing provided deeper insight for this committee on the challenges and problems facing our students, families, teachers, and school leaders. Virtual hearings have also allowed this committee to hear from even more students and parents and educators and others uh, who might have found it to be a challenge when we used to have hearings all day at City Hall. We have strived to hold this administration accountable for missteps, questionable ideas, and missed opportunities. And we'll give credit when it's due, but our main job here is oversight and holding folks accountable on behalf of our students and our school communities. With great fanfare this past December, the mayor and chancellor announced yet another bold initiative, the 2021 Student Achievement Plan. Its aim is to close the COVID-19 achievement gap it sounds great, especially with the six core tenants being many of the things that uh, this committee and I have been advocating for uh, since last summer. But the, there are questions, questionable parts that we have to de dive deeper on. It does not come into effect until September 2021. It's for the next school year. What about this existing school year? What about last year's summer school? What about last spring? Core tenant number one, getting a baseline of what ground has been lost. Are we to sit around until September 21 to get the baseline? I can tell you the ground has been lost since March 16, 2020, when schools shifted to full remote. We have been losing ground since. Over and over, I see a DOE hamstrung by a mayor whose seemingly only goal last year was to be first in the nation to open the school system. Instead of a coherent uh, long-term plan to be executed by the DOE, the administration uh, has scrambled to get devices into students' hands months uh, deep into the school year. They have scrambled to get reliable Wi-Fi into shelters, still have not executed that part of the plan. And they have scrambled to get enough teachers, which our system is still short. We have all watched our mayor set and reset school reopening dates. We have all watched our schools close and open and close and open. We see a new student achievement plan launched with literally zero details available on either the DOE's website 
or the mayor's own website. Micromanaging by this administration has stemmed the efforts of our educators and school leaders to meet the challenges of the day. Continually changing goals, whims, and priorities by, by this mayor has made the task of the DOE that much more challenging. Bearing the brunt of that burden is our students and their scholastic achievement. Today, I don't only want to hear what we're doing in September to address the learning loss. I also want to hear what's, what has been happening since March 2020 to identify, address, and begin to reverse the learning loss faced by many of our students, in addition to the trauma which many of our kids continue to face. I want to know what, what has worked, what has not worked. I want to know in detail the work that has been going ongoing by the DOE and the chief academic officer and, and her entire team in coordination with other DOE departments to get a baseline of what has been lost to increase high quality digital curriculum, to develop a one-stop uh, digital learning hub to provide more professional development opportunity to our teachers and school leaders in the context of COVID-19. Uh, expanding parent university and what steps are being taken to help those uh, who need help uh, in terms of real-time remote learning assistance and addressing the ongoing trauma and mental health crisis facing our students. Much of what I have been highlighting since we began remote virtual hearings in May of 2020. The time is now for action and not just waiting around for the next school year. Our students need relief today. The learning loss is happening um, in this moment and our students could wait no longer. I wanna thank everyone who is testifying today and I wanna thank the city council staff for all of their work that they put into today's hearing, Malcolm Butehorn, Jen Atwell, Kalima Johnson, Chelsea Betamore, Mrs. Sarkissian and Frank Perez. I also wanna thank my chief of staff, Anna Scaife, my policy director, Vanessa Ogle and director of communications, Maria Henderson. I will now turn things over to our moderator, uh, Kalima Johnson. Thank you, thank you, Chair Prager. I am Kalima Johnson, Senior Legislative Policy for the Education Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted. I will be calling on witnesses to testify in panel, so please listen for your need to be called. I will be announcing in advance who the next panel will be. So, I would like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, while you will be placed on a panel, I will be calling individuals to testify one at a time. Council members who have questions for a particular pan panelist should use the, the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on in the order with which you raised your hand after the full panel has completed testimony. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. This includes both questions and answers. Please note that for the purposes of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the surgeon at arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. Please listen for that cue. All public testimony will be limited to two minutes. At the end of two minutes, please wrap up your comments so we can move to the next panelist. Please listen carefully and wait for the surgeons to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony as there is a slight delay. Written testimony can be submitted to testimony at council.nyc.gov. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Dr. Linda Chen, Chief Academic Officer. Donald Conyers, First Deputy Chancellor. Adrian Austin, Deputy Chancellor. Lauren Siciliano, Chief Administrative Officer. Nadia Chadha, Senior Advisor. Trevonda 
Kelly, Executive Director. Catherine Drenzek, Chief of Staff. Christina Fodi, Deputy CAO. Maisra Sanchez Medina, Deputy CAO. Lawrence Peter Pendergast, Deputy CAO. Alex Brown, Senior Executive Director. I will first read the oath. And after, I will call on each panelist here from the administration individually to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Dr. Linda Chen? Yes. Donald Conyers. I do. Adrian Austin. Yes. Lauren Siciliano. I do. Trevonda Kelly. Yes. Catherine. Drunk Yes. Myra Sanchez Medina. Yes. Lawrence Pendergast. Yes. Alice Brown. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Chen, you may begin when ready. Good morning, Chair Schrager and members of the New York City Council Committee on Education here today. I'm Dr. Linda Chen and I serve as Chief Academic Officer of New York City Department of Education. I'm humbled to provide testimony on behalf of my colleagues, including those joining me this morning. First, Deputy Chancellor Donald Conyers, Deputy Chancellor Adrian Austin, and Chief Administrative Officer Lauren Siciliano and teams. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the critically important issue of student learning and academic progress during this unprecedented time. Before I begin, I would like to express our gratitude to Speaker Johnson, Chair Traeger, and the entire City Council for your continued work and advocacy on behalf of New York City schools in service of historically underserved students. While the pandemic has changed much in our lives, one thing that has not changed is this administration's commitment to our students, their families, and our staff. Our school communities have experienced true trauma over the past year, including an abrupt shift to remote learning, separation from familiar school support systems, losses of teachers and loved ones, and fear and anxiety about health and safety. And we recognize students will continue to be impacted adversely until we fully return in person to in-person learning. Clearly, all of this makes the process of teaching and learning far more challenging. In spite of this upheaval, schools have been focused on improving teaching and learning, meeting students where they are, and providing continuity of instruction and support. We are also clear-eyed about the reality once all students and staff are able to return to their school buildings, that we will need to engage in a robust academic recovery period. Our 2021 Student Achievement Plan, shared by the Mayor and Chancellor, looks ahead to what students will need next year and is rooted in healing and learning because our students will need both. This work will continue alongside our ongoing work to close the digital, digital divide and improve remote and blended learning. The bottom line is that our educators and staff members are focused on delivering the highest quality instruction possible in a supportive learning environment 
so that every student has what they need to thrive, no matter where they are learning. Recognizing that virtually all of our students were going to be involved in some form of remote learning, one of the biggest hurdles we have worked to overcome has been ensuring that students have devices. To date, we have delivered 450,000 iPads and have ordered an additional 50,000 to distribute as needed when devices break, become outdated, or need to be replaced. And that is on top of what individual schools' efforts have been. We will continue to work with our schools using a combination of central iPads, school devices, and hotspots to identify solutions to address individual needs over the remainder of the school year. We're proud of all the progress our schools have made since our overnight transformation last spring. We know that nothing can replace in-person learning for students, which is why we have gone to such great lengths to provide that option for as many students as possible, especially our most vulnerable and youngest children. Currently, we have approximately 190,000 students being served in person with across 860 pre-K to fifth grade and District 75 schools, serving some or all of their students five days per week. We continually adapted and improved our approaches to student learning and strengthened our teaching practice through instructional guidance, robust training, and high quality resources to support educators. During remote instruction, students receive at least two hours of live synchronous instruction plus asynchronous instruction that include a variety of assignments like working in small groups and one-on-one -on -one check ins with teachers. Teachers continue to be thoughtful and creative in ensuring full days of learning for all of our students. Within this context, we have provided essential supports tailored to students with disabilities and multilingual learners. In terms of educator support, we have worked with our union partners to create guidance for both remote and blended learning to identify how to structure the school day, design effective educational experiences in each model, and working collaboratively to share best practices. We have also offered hundreds of professional learning sessions in all content areas, as well as in academic intervention services. Those include supports for teaching multilingual learners and students with disabilities in remote settings. We created a DOE Google Masterclass last summer to provide teachers and administrators with an immersive experience to learn best practices for teaching remotely via Google Classroom. The Office of Curriculum Instruction and Professional Learning has offered hundreds of high quality professional development sessions to thousands of educators and administrators covering blended and remote learning and of course subject areas of math, science, social studies, ELA, arts, libraries, and academic intervention services. And through our borough citywide offices and at the district level through superintendents, teachers also receive direct professional learning specific to their school communities. Those teams hold office hours and live Q&A sessions to support school staff. Superintendents and deputy superintendents are also monitoring the remote instruction through continued visits to classrooms and offering feedback to principals and teachers to strengthen and improve remote instruction. Our schools and borough-based staff are continuing to closely monitor the progress of our students throughout this period. Prior to the pandemic, we assessed citywide performance primarily through mechanisms such as the New York State 3 through 8 math and ELA exams and Regents exams, with the state, which the state canceled last year. The DOE does not currently utilize another form of common assessment because our schools know their communities best. That knowledge is the basis for determining local strategic assessments to inform teaching and gauge student progress and growth. Schools are constantly using engagement tools to measure student learning throughout individual lessons and various diagnostic tools to assess student progress at the beginning, middle, and end of the year. Data gathered from these assessments inform how teachers design lessons and organize student learning within the classroom. The work is essential and will continue as we look towards addressing any gaps that have resulted from this difficult time. We anticipate that there will be disparate learning progress in both literacy and math with different needs at different grade levels. As we continue to look ahead, we launched the fall 2020 school experience survey this week to gather valuable feedback from our students, families, and teachers to inform the spring semester and next year. 
The survey will open Friday, February 5th. Schools, field, and central staff will have access to survey results in real time throughout the survey administration. So they can begin to take action on the feedback as soon as possible. Last month, the mayor and chancellor announced a vision for recovery across our system. The plan will continue to <clears throat> be built and informed by the final months of the school year, but our framework gives us a clear path forward. First, we are focused on accelerating instruction to advance student learning and mastery of the standards. While there is a tendency to want to cover more content to make up learning loss, what is most important to make up for lost opportunities in accelerating learning for every student is seeking depth of knowledge. To ensure students are on track, it is important to capture a baseline of where students are given the impact of the pandemic. In order to bring students back on track and begin that process, we must focus on how we can rapidly assess where students are in a low stakes manner and develop plans to advance their learning and mastery of the standards. Looking ahead to next year, we know that every school needs to have a common comprehensive assessment plan in place that includes both common screeners and formative assessments. Those will provide information for students, teachers, and families, while also empowering central executive superintendents and superintendents with citywide data trends that allow for comprehensive and targeted school, district, and citywide support. From there, we will increase access to high quality, shared, inclusive, and standards-based digital curriculum at every school to serve as a foundation for strong instruction. We want to support our school leaders to make informed curricular choices by understanding current gaps in their offerings and how to support their schools in a transition to standards-aligned digital curriculum that's culturally responsive. This work began this fall as superintendents <clears throat> engaged all principals in curricular conversations about implementing a shared and inclusive curriculum that is culturally responsive and digitally accessible. We will continue to deepen this work of supporting leaders at all levels with the knowledge they need to make informed curricular decisions and to ensure that all schools have a curriculum in place for each core content area that is high quality, culturally relevant and responsive to the students they serve. At the heart of this work will be professional learning to ensure that teachers and school leaders are well prepared for post pandemic challenges we face. We want our teachers to have the skills to make adjustments to address unfinished learning and provide students with robust opportunities to engage in rich grade level work. In a system as large as ours, we are cognizant of the fact that teachers come into teaching with varying skills. We will continue to expand our immense efforts throughout the pandemic to support educators and administrators. A critical part of this plan is expanding the innovative and successful practices of individual schools across the city. To support this work, DOE will also be phasing in a learning management system that houses lessons, tools, and activities for teachers and students that can be shared across the city. Families play an essential role in every student's education, and this has only been heightened during blended learning. It is our job to support them, and this fall, we were proud to launch Parent University, which will continue to expand. Through their New York City Schools account, families have access to free courses, resources, events, and activities. Parent University seeks to educate and empower all families from early childhood through adulthood and help them advocate for the educational success of their children. More than 93,000 people have already visited Parent University and we will continue to work on expanding the reach of these programs, in part by adding more courses in different language, languages on an ever growing range of topics. In many of our districts, families receive individualized support such as one-on-one -on -one assistance on how to access Google Classroom, and other online learning platforms, troubleshoot connections, and tend to student social emotional needs. FaceTime sessions throughout the day and evening are available to answer questions and address such concerns. Teachers have collaborated to volunteer up to two office hours per week to support parents by appointment in the areas of homework help, technology, content, and or translation. 
These office hours afford parents with the opportunity to receive guidance and assistance in their own language in navigating students' needs and supporting students' social and emotional comfort. Also integral to this plan is a citywide approach for confronting the trauma and mental health crises faced by our students. Our schools have been employing a variety of strategies to support the well-being of their students and staff members. Some schools utilize individual wellness surveys for students to complete or have daily check-ins with students around attendance and wellness. Our teachers integrate social emotional learning into lessons or at the top of each class through restorative circles. All of this work is made possible by the foundation we've built over the last two years in partnership with the council in social emotional learning and mental health supports. Our educators were prepared to immediately provide critical frontline healing and support to students because of the work we did prior to the pandemic. Additionally, we've built a partnership with health and hospitals, mental health clinics to provide clinical care to students. This work will be informed by the use of social emotional screens that empower teachers who are the staff members who know our students best to identify at-risk students and refer them to supports early. Using this information, we can help direct supports where they are needed most. That includes the 27 community schools and 150 new social workers we will bring on for next school year as part of this work. These new efforts are the first wave of a four-year plan to increase social workers in community schools throughout the city, starting with the neighborhoods most impacted by COVID-19. We are amazed at the ways our communities have worked together, supported one another, and persisted despite tremendous obstacles. And we remain committed to building resilience through wellness and strong school communities. The pandemic has tested New Yorkers and our school system in so many ways. As a community of 1.1 million students and their families and 150,000 staff, we have transformed every aspect of what we do to rise to the challenges of this moment. This is a testament to the determination of incredible staff, students, and families. This shift to remote learning and the efforts made to reopen schools in a healthy, healthy and safe manner has been astounding given the difficult, unforeseen circumstances of that crisis that exacerbated opportunity gaps that have existed for decades. Our focus remains on equitably serving our students and striving to close those disparities, which our equity and excellence for all agenda has made great progress in addressing. We are taking the lessons we learn every day to adapt and improve the delivery of education to the students of New York City in the face of the enormous challenges posed by the pandemic. On behalf of my colleagues, I thank you for your time and we are happy to answer any questions that you might have. Might have. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, just want to note that uh, we have been joined by council members Gwardenchik, uh, Rose, Brennan, Riley, uh, Drum. Also want to welcome council member Riley. This is the first uh, Education hearing together. Welcome, Councilmember Riley, Councilmember Drum, Councilmember Amphrey Samuels, uh, Councilmember Lander, Councilmember Ulrich, Councilmember Lewis, uh, Councilmember Kalos, Councilmember Levine, Councilmember Rodriguez, and Councilmember Miller. If I'm missing anyone, folks, could Councilmember Borelli, forgive me. I, I, I saw you raise your hand. You see, as a teacher, I, I, I saw the hand being raised. I heard you. Um, so, I just want to just, we'll get right to, to questions. Thank you for, for, for your testimony. Um, now, I know that some of the data has been handed over to the council, I think just for, I think for, for, for the record, um, how many students in total uh, received um, the NX grade, an NX grade where there was not, um, they needed additional time, additional support, and so they, they received sort of a holding grade before a permanent grade on their transcript. Um, as, as of this moment, this D, we have total number of students in our school system that received that NX grade.
Chair, I'm just looking for, uh, as you know, grades are constantly being entered and I just wanna make sure I have my fingers on the numbers that we shared with you. Pardon my uh, pause here. Uh, 71,675. So 71,600. 75. 75. And uh, Dr. Chen, of, has, that, has that list of students been itemized in a way where we are taking stock of the reasons or the common reasons why Many of them have been assigned an X grade. For example, how many of them only recently received an iPad or a device? Do we have that data? So um, Chair, thank you for the question. Uh, as you know, during the pandemic um, in the spring, we knew we had to make some changes to the grading policy. So the, the code NX, uh, course in progress, um, is something that we had not used uh, widely previously. Uh, as you know, as a, as a former high school teacher, and I still appreciate your experience on this committee and your leadership, um, often the alternative option would be no credit for students, um, which really is a fail, uh, a failing grade. And we knew that the impact of the pandemic required uh, some specific guidance uh, so that students would have time to finish their courses. So that's the, the numbers that we gave you. And what we have been doing is um, we have been looking at what are the reasons. So of course, students had an opportunity to um, complete the NX through summer school. And so some students took advantage of that time and schools continue to monitor the progress of those NX grades as we move forward. Well, Dr. Chen, I, if, I, if I may, um, students, from what I heard and from many teachers could not log on to connect with one another for the first couple of weeks, week, week and a half of summer school. Those who had devices, there was issues with the iLearn program. Is, is that correct? Are you familiar with that? Yes, yeah, so the platform that um, the DOE has used in the past with um, the former iZone, the iLearn NYC platform is a learning management system. And um, for the first time we were converting the system to that. And so you are correct, Chair, uh, that uh, there were some delays for some students uh, because there was trouble logging into that. And so we did learn a lot of lessons. I know part of what the hearing is about are one of the things that we learned and we learned a lot from that experience. Um, so yes, that is true. And yes, uh, I do agree with you in that um, there were fewer students that probably could, took advantage of that summer opportunity than we had hoped. And that's why our school continued to work hard to make sure that students are completing these courses. So yes, in terms of the why, um, our schools are, and I will also ask uh, Donald Conyers, my colleague as first deputy chancellor to give some more specific details to represent the hard work that's happening at schools. But uh, there are reasons for whether it's a device availability issues or some of our young people um, are working jobs as well that pre preclude them from being able to have amount of time to complete their courses. Um, there are other tra trauma informed uh, considerations that we are also uh, aware of. And so with that, I wanna just make sure I give Donald Conyers some time to represent the good work of our schools. Thank you and good morning, Mr. Chair and uh, to all the council. Thank you for having me today. Um, just continuing with uh, the responses of my colleague, uh, schools have recognized right from the beginning of this that students with NX grades deserve the patience and, uh, and the opportunity to resolve those NX grades and have worked and continue to work diligently to help students complete the coursework, to engage the learning. Uh, schools are setting up and have set up uh, 
NX committees. Schools have set up and have accentuated the work of the guidance counselors and even social workers to ensure that students are both moving along, making progress, and also feeling confident about reaching the uh, conclusion of an NX grade in, in an affirmative way. Um, it, is, it is an ongoing process, as you know, as a high school teacher. Um, our determination is and always has been to resolve the NX grades, um, which really emanated from a demonstration of, of mercy and understanding as opposed to a failing grade. Right, and, and, I, and I certainly appreciate the answers. I'm just curious to know, do we have any, for, ex for example, of the 71,000 students plus, how many of them have IEPs? How many of them are multilingual learners? Do you have that data, Dr. Chen, as well? Yes, I do. Let me just, the numbers are small, excuse me. <laughs> um, so for the number of students with IEPs, uh, that comprises 20,151 of that total, which is 28.1%. And, and how many of them are uh, multilingual learners? Uh, 13,859, which comprises 19.3%. Right, so I, it's important to get this information because as we've discussed in previous hearings, there were challenges getting devices to many of our kids, particularly students at the beginning of this remote process where there were barriers to signing up to even request a device and many kids did not have a device even into the spring. I mean, I, I, I don't want to kind of rehash the spring, but we went through this already. Um, is it accurate that these students have until the end of this month to make up the work or else they have a permanent failing grade on their transcript? Is that right? So our current policy is that students have until the end of the month to complete their courses. And um, again, I want to just... Uh, make sure the public is clear that the, the NX um, policy was devised to ensure that there was requisite compassion and consideration for students' individual situations while also holding to a standard uh, to ensure that we graduate our students with the skills that they need with the courses. And so our current policy is that students have until the end of the month and then teachers and administration have a period, a window of time to be able to post those grades. So what happens with students that, for example, who live in shelter, who still can't connect to a Wi-Fi signal? So um, I will ask that Lauren Siciliano talk a little bit more about all of the great efforts she and her team have been doing around connectivity. But I will say uh, that our students uh, in temporary housing, other students who have had issues with devices, um, that is at the forefront of our minds and we are collecting the information to determine what those needs will be and what kind of extenuating circumstances and considerations we need to have beyond the end of the month. Lauren, our Chief Thank Administrative you. Officer. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, and good morning, Chair Traeger. Um, as you know, since the spring, uh, in terms of our device distribution, we have prioritized our students in shelter. They were the first students to receive iPads, uh, and those iPads are LTE enabled so that students can connect through the cellular network even if they don't have Wi-Fi at home. Um, more recently, um, for students that have been having trouble accessing the T-Mobile cell signals in the shelters, um, our team has worked closely with DSS and with DoIT to survey um, all students in those shelters and where any um, families were struggling with the T-Mobile signal, we swapped out those devices for a Verizon signal. Um, we continue to follow up with those families. We have a dedicated uh, help desk just for students in shelter um, and have also deployed on tech, um, uh, on-site tech support um, to, to those shelters. Um, in addition, the city has been working to install Wi-Fi in the shelters. Um, the uh, current plan, the uh, Department of Information Technology and Telecommunication and DSS are working to install the Wi-Fi in all shelters by the summer. Um, and there is a, a group of about 25 shelters with 
um, greater connectivity issues that are first on the list and are actually um, being completed right now. So Lauren, I mean, I, I, I appreciate, I, I, I sense, I know that you care and folks on this Zoom quite care. It's just the issue that I wanna flag is that um, doing surveys now and, and planning to install things by summer. Um, as mentioned, I am a former high school history teacher. And if my students missed two or three days of instruction, that was a lot. We're talking about kids missing months, about almost a year now of, of meaningful, consistent, continued instruction. Um, that's, that's devastating to them. And this is time that they're never gonna get back, folks. And I, I think, um, you know, there's no way to sugarcoat this. Um, and we have to act with a sense of urgency to account for this learning loss and trauma and to come up with um, action, actionable plans to address things right now in the short term and of course in the long term. But I would say in the short term, um, and I'll be very clear about this, no child in New York City should be assigned a failing, permanent, damaging grade for something that they bear no responsibility for. The system failed them. Government failed them. That's who gets the failing grade, not our children. And so I think we need to work with these annex committee, sort of speak, in school. This is new to me, and if, if they, they formed it, that's good. Um, but these kids need support. They need internet device, they need instruction. They need teachers, they need connections. Uh, they don't need to be uh, given a, a damaging permanent grade, something that, particularly for something that's no, no, no faults of, of their own. I'm also just wanna ask a couple of questions. Uh, Dr. Chen, you mentioned that now uh, over 450,000 iPads have been uh, now delivered. Um, I just want to note for the record that when the mayor initially announced 300,000 devices last spring, I questioned him on that number. And he said over and over again that every kid who needs a device has a device. That was obviously not true because the city of New York knowingly entered this school year with thousands and thousands of kids still without devices. When is the, can, can, does anyone know, uh, when did the last iPad shipment arrive to our students? Does anyone know, like, when, when did the last box get to our kids? Uh, I, can, I can take that. Um, so we obviously share your, your sense of urgency in ensuring that students get the tools that they need as quickly as possible. Um, I think it's, it's really important to keep in mind that device need is uh, a constantly fluid need. There are students who have access to devices and uh, internet one day who don't the next because the device stops working, it's out of date, a family member needs it. Um, so that is a constantly changing need and something that we are constantly monitoring. So a student who needs a device today, it doesn't mean that they haven't had one for the whole time um, and it will continue to evolve. And that's why in addition to the 450,000 that we've distributed, um, we've also ordered another uh, 50,000 that are arriving as we speak for needs that will continue throughout the school year. Um, so in, in terms of the timeline that you asked about, um, in the spring, when we made the transition to remote learning, um, we immediately ordered 300,000 devices. We worked with Apple to get and prep those devices um, in a matter of weeks, hundreds of thousands of devices out to students. Um, and between the, the spring and summer, we delivered about 320,000 devices. Uh, in the fall, when students returned, schools worked with families to confirm what their needs were. Uh, and in particular, they used some of those instructional orientation days in September to confirm student need. Um, and that continued, of course, to evolve. Based on that feedback, we distributed another 30,000 in the fall um, and then placed the order for the 100,000 that were delivered um, before the end of uh, last calendar year. So uh, that's sort of the, the sequence. And as we've seen demand increase, we've then been ordering um, to, to meet that need. I mean, you, I, I, I'm reliving uh, last spring because I, as I mentioned in previous hearings that last spring, communities and wealthier zip codes in New York were debating and arguing over Zoom versus Google Meet 
and neighborhoods like mine in, in Coney Island and other parts of, of the city uh, were asking, where is my device? Where is my internet? I, I also want to know, um, you're, we heard about iPads. I didn't hear about Chromebooks and laptops. It, it, a high school kid cannot type up an essay on an, on an iPad. It is not easy to type anything onto an iPad. I'm sure council members and staff can attest that as well. Um, how many requests have you received and you've delivered on in terms of laptops to our students with internet service as well? So for the iPads, what we've done is, particularly for our older students, as you mentioned, um, we have ordered um, keyboard cases. So the iPads um, come with keyboard cases uh, and it then functions very much like a Chromebook because the, the case becomes the keyboard and you can uh, use the iPad that way. Uh, schools, of course, are also distributing devices that they have. Um, and we have uh, done, we have worked with the Fund for Public Schools to purchase and distribute some Chromebooks as well. Um, LTE enabled Chromebooks, um, uh, given the, the volume that we needed and the price point, um, that's why we wound up going with the iPads. Um, we have done some distributions of Chromebooks in limited circumstances, but also then ordered the keyboards in order to make sure that we could have a, a device that's comparable, more comparable to the Chromebook. And, and how does school, how, do, how does, a, how does a student know that a keyboard is available to them if, if they want it? Because many schools folks I, I talked to didn't even know that that option existed. So we send it out automatically with the iPad for older okay. students. And when did that start? Uh, that started, I need to check the specific date. It was after the initial distribution in the spring. Um, we heard the same feedback that you're hearing that it's difficult to type on the iPad, particularly for older students. And at that point ordered keyboard cases. Yeah, if you can get back to me on when that started, I, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Um, I, I also wanna ask um, how many students have we have never been able to connect with whether it's virtual or in person since March. Does anyone have that total number? Yes, I'll answer that. I believe, um, and I'll preface it by saying that of the 1.1 million, our goal continues to be to connect with every student, as you know, uh, Chair. Um, to date, uh, we're around 2,600 students that are still being pursued, uh, and we're looking into with social workers, attendance teachers, and uh, school personnel to locate and to ensure that students become uh, uh, connected, logged on. And do you have data as far as of, of that number, uh, students with... Uh, IEPs, multilingual learners, students who live in shelter, or any other type of data that you could share with us? I, I do not at the moment, Chair. I don't have that specific breakdown. And if a student only recently received a device and still dealing with internet service, but is dealing with a lot of trauma in their, you know, in their lives, how is the DOE providing uh, services for them, because I, from, to my understanding, whether it's, it's a social worker or counseling services are done virtually, how does a student without reliable internet or, or reliable device receive uh, those types of counseling sessions? Or are we assuming, and I'm going to make the assumption that the students that may not have devices also have the ability and the opportunity for in-person instruction, thereby giving them at least two days uh, during the week to be in person, um, if not more. Um, and to compensate for the device, there are, there are um, definitely some instructional materials that students have received for the um, social emotional wellness students. Uh, we have schools that are making telephone calls. We have schools that are utilizing and maximizing the in-person opportunities, uh, the time the students are in to ensure that students both feel a sense of um, uh, consistency and understanding about how they are uh, able to navigate and move forward during this crisis, which has been improving, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, every day, every time students, students are uh, adjusting, they're resilient, and our teaching force, we are doing everything possible to uh, ensure that students are feeling that uh, embrace with that comfort and security. So Deputy Chancellor, just to kind of 
you know, to add to this uh, line of questioning based on your, your, your comments and to Dr. Chen as well. Um, how many virtual classes have students over, over 30 students in, in a virtual class? Uh, it's my understanding that they could go up to 60 or even more. How many virtual classes have over 30 students on a roster? So given the, the good question, given the enormity of our district as a whole, and you know that every school, every district has its own identity, its own uh, way of completing the uh, favorable business of educating, it's impossible for me to sit here. Uh, I, I was sworn in to tell the truth. It's impossible for me to sit here to tell you how many uh, on a school by school, how many students are in virtual classes. We don't know, we do, this I do know. Principals want to optimize the learning experience and it, principals will take every and make every effort to in, uh, reduce that ratio of student to teacher where possible to ensure that students have the quality, time, care, feedback, and the ability to, uh, to, to learn and ask questions. So uh, to your specific uh, question, I don't have a number like that, but I, I do understand the pattern and the motivation of leaders in terms of the assignment of staff and to teachers, teachers to staff, to students uh, in a remote setting. So I, I appreciate your, your, your honesty and I would just appreciate if the DOE can get me that data on how many classes in our school system where we have uh, virtual classes over 30 kids and Dr. Chen, do you know off the top of your head, are there, are there any classes with 50, 60 students virtually in them right now? So Chair, as part of our partnership with the UFT uh, in terms of class sizes, it is possible of the scenario that you're talking about of over 50 given uh, the remote um, blended teachers, that means the the teachers that are teaching the students who are in blended and learning on their remote days. And that was an agreement that we had with the UFT that uh, contractual sizes could uh, be more than the usual uh, because of the nature of that kind of teaching is different than uh, of the other modes. So I'm gonna put my high school teacher hat back on for a moment where I had 34 students, that was the contractual limit back in my day teaching high school. And even with 34 students in person, in person, it is a challenge to account for every single need of every single child in a class at the same time. Um, I, don't, I don't say this with pride to say that there is no way that we are meeting the needs of all of our kids under this system right now. Um, there is no way a teacher, and mind you, if the teacher has reliable internet themselves, because many teachers also don't have reliable internet, but there is no way a teacher could account for the needs of 50, 60 kids in a virtual class. That, that is just not happening. And that's why the purpose of this hearing is to take stock of the academic, you know, uh, the learning impact on our kids. But I, 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 I'm finding it a challenge here uh, to, to believe that we've actually taken that stock. I don't think we have found the depths of how much loss our kids have experienced yet because it is, it, it is very hard, almost impossible for an educator uh, to, to account for the needs of 50, 60 kids virtually. I also wanna ask Dr. Chen, do we know how many ICT classes are missing the second teacher? So, Chair, I, I first want to uh, acknowledge what you've, what, what you've said here. I think that every day, in terms of taking stock, because it, it is a very critical uh, issue. And we, not just in New York City, but across the country, everyone's world has been turned upside down by all of these things. We've come back with health and safety measures. We've come back with devices. And this piece around learning uh, loss and the ability to determine progress, we are absolutely, um, there, there are no easy answers here. So I appreciate the, the hearing on this to be able to unpack some of those things. 
What I will say is that every day we learn more about both, I would say, the places where there's great need to accelerate. And we also learn every day, I know the first deputy chancellor and I uh, go on virtual class visits together uh, at times. And I also know, I see every day the hard work of teachers and administrators actually gaining progress with students. So I think taking stock uh, includes all of those things because we need to also take stock of the good things that are happening in order to make them scalable and across the system. Uh, so, so yes, there are a number of things that we may not have all the precise numbers for you because there's school uh, level management that happens. Um, so in terms of your question around um, the ICT model, um, as you also may know, the State Department also issued some guidance partway into the beginning of the school year to clarify some things on the ICT front. I will tell you that as information in terms of the numbers that you want, we will need to get back to you on the numbers. I don't have those numbers at my fingertips right now, um, but I will tell you that we have worked very hard to make sure um, that we can provide the best uh, education possible to every student. Yes, uh, I'm not going to stand here and say to you that uh, over class size or even at class size are ideal numbers. I agree with the experiences that you've expressed. However, we have, have to have and continue to have found ways to do the best with the circumstances that we have. Taking stock and continually getting better with that. Um, so that was something that we agreed to in the summer to be able to organize the logistics of being able to do blended and um, all remote and blended remote. We had to make some, um, some agreements to, to figure out ways that I don't think any of us would say are ideal conditions. Um, so, so I wanna say that on that front and on the ICT front, um, we will certainly get you whatever numbers we can get you for that. Dr. Chen, I, I would appreciate those numbers because I've heard from a number of parents and a number of school communities that because of staff shortages, their, their children are not uh, being given um, and they have a right to, I, ICT is a part of also an IEP mandate and they have a right to have this. And you know, the, state could, the state could write whatever clarifying language they want, the needs of our kids don't disappear, they're still there. You can't amend the needs of our children. They're still there. Uh, and and um, I, we, do, we do need this information, but as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking that there could be a child with an NX grade that, that could be sitting in a virtual class with 50 other students, and they have until the end of this month, a week, to make up work Otherwise, they get a permanent failing grade. Are you giving schools guidance and, and strong recommendations to take stock of these situations so our kids do not get this permanent failing grade? Are you allowing schools and pushing them to get to give these kids more time for more support? Yes. So we are. I will ask uh, my colleague Donald Conyers to say more about the specific work that's been happening on the school front, but I, I, I wanna say a couple of things first about the, the large class size piece that you're bringing up. I just wanna make sure there's not some misunderstanding. In those cases where there may be large class sizes, it is not the main mode of instruction that the students are getting. That condition is for students who are in person blended and on their off days from being in person at home. That's the only circumstance where those large numbers are. I just wanna make sure, Chair, that um, you have the right information on that. Um, it is not the main mode of instruction. So if a student is fully remote, they're not in these class sizes that you're describing of 50 as the main mode of instruction. Um, but in terms of the NX and, and we, agree with you, uh, our, and that's why we changed our grading policy for the pandemic, because while we need to hold those high standards because we owe students a, a solid education, we also must be um, considerate of the, the, the 
depths of trauma that individual students experience and the device issues that you're talking about. So students in those situations are not going to be penalized here. I just wanna make that clear. So let me pivot over to Donald to talk about what's happening at the school in terms of the NX. So I'll, I'll, I'll give an example and I'll give an example that hopefully chair will resonate with you. Um, uh, Dr. Chen and I visited John Dewey uh, High School uh, where they have approximately 2,400 uh, NX uh, grades at the moment. This school not only has structured itself- 2,400 in students. I, I'm saying 2,400 NX grades. I don't know if they're students because it could be, I could have, uh, received That's, an index in one course and one uh, and, and, and two in another for another okay. student. You know, that, I, so that I seems, can't. Okay, I'm sorry, because that sounds like they're enrollment, but go ahead. So it might be, so my numbers may be off, but I still want you to get the value of the, of the illustration, please. Uh, this student, these students are, are enveloped with the kind of uh, support and awareness. So they have not just an NX grade, but they also have teams of, of uh, professionals, teachers and assistant uh, principals that are working with students, touching base with them, talking about the work, providing opportunities for them to, uh, to express challenge, to, to receive additional support. They, they've carved out um, time for the students to receive that support, not just saying they need help, but they've also found time to, to provide the support to them. Every teacher and every principal starts from the premise or the reality that they want all students to begin this journey of NX and complete in the affirmative. So we are working and have been working to your earlier question, uh, have schools been advised? Schools have been advised from the very beginning by our chancellor and by our office as to making sure that we maximize the opportunity. Our chancellor used the term, two words, patience, and, and understanding or in grace. We've been utilizing that, but also pushing and, and uh, gently pushing the, uh, the, um, the overarching need to begin to uh, advance the learning, to continue the learning, understanding that the emotional wellness comes hand in hand. So the NX grade is just another part of the machinery that schools are undertaking. And I, I know you have isolated that, but I do have to tell you that the the uh, students that have the NX grades are being, uh, uh, are being embraced, supported. They're being spoken to on a regular. They are, there's progress being made and, and schools are doing the very best that they can to push and pull students along that may have some uh, additional difficulty with completing. That is the goal. That is what we signed up for before NX was ever um, a reality in our system and they've continued to do that. Uh, even through this pandemic. Well, and, and the reason, uh, um, Deputy Chancellor, I, I mentioned NX is because, as I mentioned before, it's hard to take some stock of some data um, about to try to quantify what what uh, our give me one moment to quantify what our students are going through, how much loss they're experiencing. So we're looking at different different type of data points, but. Um, it's also accurate that uh, there are high school students with IEPs that don't go to District 75 that right now are not going to in-person. Is that correct, Dr. Chen? That is correct. So there are children with IEPs that do not have right now currently access to in-person instruction that might be uh, in a very large Virtual virtual class. Do we have current data on the amount of teachers our schools are short to provide uh, five full days of instruction for those schools that are currently um, open for in-person instruction? Do we have any data on the depths of the staff shortages our schools are experiencing? So Chair, I'd like to ask Lauren Siciliano, our Chief Administrative Officer, to expand a little bit more on that. But I just want to make sure, I, 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 I want to make sure I'm not uh, misunderstanding a statement that you made. The middle school, high school students, as you, you know, noted, are all virtual right now. I want to also make sure we're clear that that 50, that class size piece was only for remote blended students. No one is blended in middle school, high school right now. So 
there aren't the class sizes of 50 that you're describing going on right now because they're all virtual. I just wanna make sure that that's very clear. Um, so uh, Lauren, can you provide a little bit more on the staffing question? Sure, happy to. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, in terms of how we are supporting our schools with staffing, um, since the summer, we have been working closely with schools, particularly through our borough citywide offices to ensure that uh, they had the staff that they needed. Um, and if that required additional allocation from us, we did that. We've been uh, fortunate that the administration has made uh, reopening and um, the needs of our students such a priority. Um, so we've been able to allocate additional dollars to schools to um, hire new teachers, use substitutes, um, use existing teachers to cover more classes. Um, and we have continued to do that as more and more schools have moved to five days. We work closely with uh, the first deputy chancellor team to understand where where that is an impediment for schools so we can give them the resources that they need in order to extend to five days so currently uh how many um how many atrs are currently now um working as full-time staff in schools right now do, do we have that data um i can get you the specific number on that Okay, and do we have data on how many ATRs are not placed right now? Um, I, I will get you the specific numbers that all of our ATRs are deployed to support schools, whether that's um, in long term absence coverage or uh, a more permanent assignment, but I'm happy to get you the breakdown. And how many currently how many uh, substitute teachers are working on long term full time assignment? Do we have that data? So on any given day, we have um, on average between 3,800 and 4,000 subs uh, working on any given day in the system. Are they working in the same school with the same kids or are they moving around the system? It's a mix. So we have students who are, uh, because of staff shortages, not having the same teacher, is that, is that right? Um, I think that it, uh, it varies based on the needs of the school. The school may have a short-term assignment because someone is out for a shorter period of time versus a longer-term need. And uh, can you just, uh, you might have mentioned it, forgive me, I, I missed it. How many schools currently are open for five days a week? I'll add to, uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Right now for our elementary uh, uh, pre-K to five and district 75, we have 247 schools that have students uh, attending five days a week. And we have another 259 schools where the majority of the students are, will, are in attendance five days. And then like the 354, 55, uh, where they have prioritized the attendance of students that may be uh, considered more of the needy population where they've been able to get them in for five days. And, and let's say from the start of this year so far, how many total school closures um, have taken place? Does anyone have that data? I don't have that data, but I can say that they were closed, not because we wanted to, but because we had to. <laughs> Does anyone have a number on that? Just making a note to get that back. But I will register once again that they were closed out of an abundance of caution and because of health and safety reasons. Of course, um, and I would just note that for, for those reasons also, it's just, it's, it's a continued, um, another interruption in instruction and it, it becomes a greater, another challenge for, for those school communities and, and for the kids. I'm not sure, and I wanna to turn to my colleagues, but I'm not sure if I heard a direct answer on the number of staff we are short in order to make all the schools 
uh, serve open five days a week? I'm not sure if I heard an answer on that. So on the staffing front, uh, and Donald, of course, please feel free to jump in here as well. Um, the reason why I can't give you numbers is because as schools identify that as a barrier, we work with the schools to solve that barrier. So it's a constant ongoing review um, in order to make sure that the schools have the staff that they need. Well, I mean, we still have many schools not open. So obviously they're still facing the barrier. So what is, what are the barriers um, that you're, I mean, what, what, here's what I am sensing and folks could feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think City Hall, and I'm, I'm not saying DOE, City Hall, is um, working in reality on the severe staff shortage we have in the school system right now. Uh, I know DOE is aware of it because you have to deal with it every day. And I don't know how you could advise a principal just to kind of, you know, you can't make that need disappear. It's there, unless you're gonna put more kids together in the same class, which as you know, detrimentally hurts uh, instruction. Um, has DOE requested additional resources from OMB and from the mayor's office for more money to hire more staff so more of our young children um, and children, uh, our most vulnerable children, can go to school uh, five days a week? So I, I, I want to jump in, and then Lauren, you can clarify, correct anything as needed. First of all, the uh, the realistically um, funds resources are being provided have been provided and as you know chair um, if you were absent as a social studies teacher and you were in a uh, the middle of a pandemic when people were a little unsure about their own safety so we have educators that want to do their best to come in but refuse to come in because of the safety so having the funds available does not always uh, equate to having a body, a live body in front of students. Um, we know that on a daily basis, as Lauren indicated, we have uh, upwards of 4,000 um, substitute teachers. That is a, it is a commitment being made. Um, and these teachers are doing their, their work, they're doing God's work to ensure that our students are um, educated. It is not City Hall that is uh, preventing teachers from coming into our system. It is not City Hall that is preventing um, uh, the teachers to remain with the students for the duration of, of a semester. It is the nature of the business and you know yourself how substitute teaching is. You know how ensuring the continuity of instruction is important. We are endeavoring to do all of those things and we are, yes, we're standing up a system that many I mean, they're not doing it. They can't do it. And I, I feel that I'm looking for, I'm looking for the positive in that. And we are working to endeavor to, to move others toward that positivity and stay there as we improve. And so, if I could yeah. just add on, on the funding front uh, to answer that part of the question as well. Um, as I mentioned, the administration has made uh, opening of schools a priority. And so this year we've been able to give schools significant additional dollars on top of their regular budgets to fund a range of, of opening needs. Uh, it's about 180 million in total for a range of things like nurses and PPE, including uh, $80 million in additional funds for staffing. Right, but the mayor also said last year that every kid who needed a device had a device and that wasn't true because we had to subpoena information, which was very damaging to City Hall. And we learned that 77, over 77,000 kids entered the school year still without a device after the mayor said that everyone who needed it had one. I have never heard the mayor use his bully pulpit and his platform to put out a clarion call for additional school staff um, to address the needs of, of our school community. And look, I support every single educator who made a request for medical accommodations, for medical reasons, I support them. But I also think that we need to be mindful that because of the staff shortages, that's why high schools could only offer virtual study hall because there's not, not enough staff in them. But no one ever put out a call for action. 
Um, and substitute teachers who I greatly value, having them move around, um, what does that do to, to the stability of the classes and of the children? If they have a different person coming before them all the time, that, that's, 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 tough. That's, that's tough. And, and so I'm gonna pause here because I'm mindful of time and my colleagues have been very patient. So I'm gonna now call on some of my colleagues for uh, some, some, of their, some of their questions. Uh, and I see a couple of hands raised um, and I'll, I want to turn it over to actually to council member Riley. This is uh, his first um, education hearing with us in the council. It's an honor to have, have him and we welcome him. And council member Riley, please, you, you may, may ask your questions. Thank you, Chair Traeger. And I, I just want to commend your leadership uh, for advocating for, for parents. Uh, I'm a parent right now and I've been home with my daughter doing remote learning and it's very challenging. Uh, especially, you know, doing the hearings and, and, and working and, and trying to help her um, work at the same time. And she's in kindergarten and she's really a social butterfly. And the fact that she can't be around her classmates and engage with them has been really a challenge for her. So I really do commend um, your leadership, Chair Traeger. Um, DOE, thank you for so much for being here. And, and my question really um, falls with the 2021 Achievement Plan. Uh, it seems to be a mix of short and long-term strategies. And I'm particularly interested in how these investments will help us ensure equity for all students now and in the future. And for example, uh, the DOE sees investments in things like high quality uh, digital curriculum, helping close, close the achievement gap and ensuring equity after school operations return to normal. So I just uh, wanna see how we, we, we take that into the short term on uh, long-term strategies to achieve uh, uh, equity amongst our children, especially children um, of color within our communities that have been struggling a lot um, during this pandemic um, with education. Councilman Riley, thank you for your question and, and thank you for your partnership as a parent in city schools uh, to really uh, work with us and teachers and schools to in the education of your, your child. Um, thank you. And we appreciate that direct perspective too. So um, yes, I think that uh, the, the plan that the mayor and the chancellor shared around um, the, uh, the student achievement plan, um, I would say, I, I appreciate your characterization of short and long-term. Um, I do think that while uh, it was explicitly stated that it is the plan for next school year, we know the long runway that it takes to be able to get the plans together. So while we are expressing a plan for the next school year, a number of these things, the foundations for these things, to your, to, to your point, have, are being laid as well. So I'll start first with the curricular piece. Um, part of that work has already begun. And in, in regards to your question around equity, it's important for us, um, while we are trying to bridge the digital divide, it's also a moment that we're not letting up on the DOE's commitment to culturally relevant and sustaining education. Um, as you may know, we um, promulgated a policy or a definition of that in the PEP a few summers ago, two summers ago, I believe it was July. And that con continues to be uh, not just a value that we hold, but it is an educational imperative to be able to provide texts and materials that are culturally relevant for students. And so that continues to be part of this plan that's in the curricular aspects. I would say also on the front of equity, it's important for us to be able to have a baseline of where every student is academically um, that isn't left to um, disparate resources or capacities at the school levels, but that as a system, we're able to know where every student is at and in, in terms of equity, then we can really be able to place our resources and supports in the places that need it the most. And so that's another part of what you see in that plan. Um, the, the learning management system is a place where everything is. So we have heard, even in the spring and, and continuing now, um, the great work of Adrienne Austin and her team around parent and university has been helpful, but we know that it's helpful to have uniformity in a system that everyone can access readily for all of these pieces of information. And that's why there's a commitment that you see in that plan for learning management system. Um, all of these things would not 
you know, these resources would not be well spent if we didn't commit to professional learning for our educators in the system to be able to use all of these things, to be able to use the information on every student and tie it to that culturally responsive, tailored lesson uh, and materials in order for every student. To us, it's about equity and excellence, right? It's access and it's the ability to be able to know who a student is who they are socially, emotionally. That's also why those screens are part of our plan. It's not just academic screening, but knowing the wellness of every student. We need to be able to connect with students on that level in order to use that information about where they are academically in order to engage and support them. And that's also why in that plan, there's that commitment to social emotional learning and community schools over the course of several years, but beginning and committed to the greatest the, the I'm expired. that are committed, the, the, the most impacted communities across the city. Thank you. Um, I'll come back for a second round, if that's all right with the chair. Sure, Councilman Riley. Uh, I want to also just mention that we've also uh, been joined by council members um, uh, Dharma Diaz and, and I welcome Councilmember Diaz and Councilmember Barron. And I believe uh, next uh, for questions, I think we I saw the hand up of, was it Councilmember Kalos? Time yes. starts now. I just want to follow up on some of uh, Chair Traeger's questions and uh, ask that you write them down because there will be at least four. So um, how many students don't have a device as of this morning? Plain and simple. Uh, how many remote learners didn't log in this morning? If you don't know, would you let me build an app to do it? Do you support legislation introduction 2138 to guarantee every public student an iPad or laptop moving forward? That's the first question. The second one, can we desegregate online learning for this spring? By way of background on August 7th, I sent a proposal to do so with Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus former co-chair Robert Cornegie. On August 23rd, the New York Post endorsed the idea. On October 16th, the chancellor expressed openness to the idea at an education committee hearing. On the 22nd, the chancellor said at a Queens Parental Advisory Board meeting, and I quote, in a virtual environment, if you have some criteria that a student could ostensibly with a very gifted teacher have more students having experience of gifted experience, not just in one classroom. Let's say you have a really gifted and talented teacher that is willing to have 60 students across five schools in Queens. Now you have the ability to give that experience to more students. Where is DOE in implementing a desegregated online education for this spring? If not now, then when? That's also from Pure Kea Vote. Uh, third question. Do you believe in social promotion? Would you allow parents and students to choose to repeat a grade so that they aren't thrown into a class where they start in September a year and a half behind students with more privilege, which would only further the achievement gap along what would likely continue to be racial lines? My last question is, what is DOE doing to provide parents whose children would have a dedicated paraprofessional in the classroom with those same services in the home on remote learning days? Thank you. Thank you for the forewarning about the pen. Uh, so let me try to take some of these. And then I also want to include our Chief Administrative Officer, Lauren Siciliano, and some of the uh, device and, and metrics uh, in, uh, questions that you raised. Um, so, um, okay. Around the desegregation idea that you raised, uh, we really, think that, you know, obviously it's a very worthy um, role. And one of the challenges, and this, this came up uh, quite honestly in a number of our conversations um, in the spring even, how do we leverage, um, because now learning is beyond the four walls. And one of the challenges, while um, that is a, a very valid idea and, and a good one, um, is that uh, 
a lot of things schools already had to do to get school up and running. And I think this would be one of those things, um, council member, I think that would be a good next step to, to actually operationalize. I think the reason why you haven't seen it uh, at scale um, is that there are a number of things that need to be operationalized for that. And we've been trying to get a sense of normalcy in terms of staffing and what teachers have on their plate and to add students from different schools and those kinds of things becomes another thing that we want to make sure logistically works and importantly that that teachers um, feel comfortable with the training and i think the other piece about that is we want to make sure that teaching ultimately is yes teachers knowing their content and their students um, but also that ability to connect with students is a, is a huge piece and so that's also something that we want to ensure greater continuity before their students. The record can reflect that there were three minutes left when I asked my questions and no. they've used most of the time to not answer the first question. Uh, the chancellor said he wants to do it. Uh, all you have to do is start offering the program to the students and connect them with the teachers. Will you do it? We've also had some of that. And can we move on to yeah. the other questions? Can we get a yes or a no and then just move on to the rest of the questions? Because the chair indulges me asking multiple questions, but I, I gave you the majority of my time to answer the question. So please take your time to answer. So I will pivot over. Yes, that is something that we will uh, continue to do. There's some evidence of that already, but I don't want to take up time. Lauren, if you want to just go back to the top, we'll take it in the order that you asked them, sir. I think she needs to be unmuted. Yes, thank you. Um, so in terms of your questions about the uh, number of students who still Time need expired. devices, uh, students who still need devices, um, as I said, we've uh, delivered about 450,000 devices. Um, we have about 5,800 open requests that have come in recently in the past few weeks. Um, but as I mentioned, we had already ordered 50,000 more iPads. So we have already begun shipping devices out to those students. Um, on the number of students who hadn't logged in, uh, Donald, I think you shared that earlier. Would you mind um, sharing that one? Uh, the number I gave earlier was uh, 2,600. That's the number I gave uh, concerning the login. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, I believe next uh, we'll hear from Council Member Baron. I'm starts now. Council member, you're muted. Let's unmute Council Thank Member Barron. Thank you, that was on my part. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the chair for this hearing and thank you to the panel for coming and answering our questions. We heard a lot about the efforts to provide devices to students, but yet we know that there are still students who don't have the devices that they need or the ones that have devices are in fact uh, devices that are not always functioning. My question is moving forward, knowing that there are thousands of students, predominantly black and Latino students who have not had the opportunity to be in a learning environment and to gather the uh, instruction that's being given what are the plans moving forward to compensate these students, to compensate uh, the families that have lost out on that time on task? What are the plans now to provide additional resources, additional support, additional instruction time, and perhaps even additional finances? We heard about the students who are, have special needs and really have been very much uh, disadvantaged beyond what their normal circumstances are. What are the plans now so that we don't start scrambling when we try to get back to what we call normal? What are we doing now to put those plans and programs and resources and initiatives in place, particularly in those schools where those students and in those uh, areas where students are living in temporary housing, 
what are we doing now? And then I have some other questions, but I wanna hear that one first. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Barron for your questions. Uh, in the interest of time, I just wanna pivot over to Katie Jenner regarding students in temporary housing. Who are we waiting for? Can someone in, uh, unmute Katie Jenner? Hi, sorry, I was uh, muted. Uh, so um, I, I understand the question was about uh, supports for students in temporary housing. No, my okay, question so is what are your plans now? What are you putting in place now for that period of time or that point in time when students do return understanding that there's been a tremendous loss of learning. There's been a tremendous uh, time where students have not been able to benefit from instruction for a number of reasons. What are we doing now to be able to provide for those students? What are the plans? What are the initiatives? What is the thinking? Who's being involved in making those uh, strategic decisions? Uh, in terms of academic support or overall? Overall, everything. Okay. Children have lost Great. out. It's been yes, a year. they certainly have. Yes. So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about um, the supports that we have in place for um, mental health and social emotional support, particularly, and then maybe other people want to chime in more on the academic side. Um, since the uh, beginning of our transition to remote learning in March, we knew that there was going to be uh, tremendous loss for students, uh, not only academically but also in terms of their, uh, you know social worlds, their, uh, you know, emotional support, their mental health support. And my, my division, which is the Division of School Climate and Wellness under Deputy Chancellor Sean Robinson, started thinking right away about how we could support kids both during remote learning and in the return. So, and we were very fortunate that we were able to build on um, supports that we did have in place that we've built up over the last two years, many of them with the council support, including a greatly increased number of uh, social workers and special uh, specialized social workers to uh, support with trauma in particular. Um, you know, being able to provide those remote services to students was uh, imperative. Um, we also opened the beginning of this year um, with a mass training for all staff uh, in trauma responsive educational practices. This is both for staff who are in person and who are remote. Uh, and so we, you know, and we gave everyone a um, at the beginning of the school year, a bridge to school plan to help bridge that, uh, you know, gap between the time when students were last in and when they were now returning. Um, uh, you know, we were very fortunate and I thank again the council for their support in maintaining our level of support staff like social workers uh, throughout this school year. And I'm very happy to say that moving uh, into next school year, we will build on what we have done this year. Um, uh, with three key steps. One is gonna be a, uh, what we call a mental health screener for all students uh, to get a very, very brief assessment of where they are at and determine the best way to direct services, including which I'm very excited about, um, new services we're able to bring on board starting next year, beginning with 27 new community schools and 150 social workers. These uh, resources are gonna be the first, this is the first year in a plan for over for four full years of, to continue to increase both of those resources. And we're gonna direct them at the neighborhoods that were hardest hit by COVID, those 27 districts that we know, you know had the worst uh, time during all of this, um, including many of our areas that tend to suffer the most. Uh, and this way we'll be able to direct this to where these needs to where we know, these resources to where we know the needs are greatest. Mr. Chair, if I could ask for the uh, question about the academics as well. Absolutely, Councilman Barron, because uh, I know that there was an issue with folks muting, unmuting, so you have extra time, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. So in addition to, I would say, these are what I'm going to describe and delineate are things that we are doing now and had started already in the spring and we're doing more of this work. So a couple of things. One is what we're doing now is to ensure that there is seamless engagement of students if they're going in person and to remote. There's been a lot of hundreds of thousands of teachers engaging in professional learning to get better at the technology engagement piece of this, this puzzle. Um, so that continues on because we know that that engagement is very important. 
And we also have been making sure that there are grade level lessons on a weekly basis uploaded in Teach Hub for teachers in all content areas K through 12. We started this in the spring and this school year in September, we've been uploading weekly lessons that are also ready for Google Classroom so that we've been able to up the ante a little bit on the quality of uh, a digital, um, digitally accessible materials. And then we've really been supporting teachers from the very beginning. We knew that there would be great impact in learning progress. So we created, the state has standards, as you know, I know as an educator, you know, that teachers have to be able to meet and students to learn. And what we did was we knew that there would be quite a bit of flexibility in the in-person and remote. And so we wanted to focus on priority learning standards. So what we did was we released those to schools in the fall. That way teachers can economize and make efficient their planning on the standards that mean that matter the most because all of those anchor standards would be supported by other supporting standards. That way students are really um, able to get their best ability to stay on track on grade level. Uh, my time has expired and I thank the chair. And I just wanna say to me, that does not respond to what I see are going to be the needs. We know what students need. I'm wanting to hear how we're going to construct a school learning environment beyond the regular uh, 8.30 to three day that will give students additional time. You can't just cram it into a regular school day. And I'm not hearing that with all due respect, I'm not hearing that. So I hope that we can look further to make sure that when we get back to normal or when the new norm starts, there's, there's designated time for students to make up for this lost year. And finally, I just wanna say, I totally agree with my colleague, colleague Ben Kalos. It should be in my mind, I'm not a tech person, it should be easy to uh, design whatever you need to design to allow students to sit online, to sit in an auditing capacity, to get advantage of instruction at our more elite and select schools. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you, Council Member uh, Barron. Um, on your note, also, we've been joined by Council Member Drum. Um, and I wanna turn now for questions, uh, my, my uh, colleague, Councilmember Lewis, who has been a real champion and a real leader on the fight to make sure that all of our kids actually get devices and internet in their hands. So thank you, Councilmember Lewis, for your leadership, and we turn to you next for questions. Time starts now. Thank you so much, Chair Traeger, for um, holding this hearing today uh, and for the opportunity to, to ask some questions. And I wanna thank the panel for being here to, to answer the question, some of our questions and to take some of this back. Um, I have two quick questions. One is on um, English language learners and the other one is on students with disabilities. In regards to students that are English language learners, we've heard concerns um, and shared concerns about the lack of instructional support that they have not received. Um, particularly bilingual instruction um, in some of our schools. So I think, you know, this continues to perpetuate the digital divide because some of them have devices, some of them do not have devices. So it's hard for them to get the instructional support that they need. So I wanted to know what efforts were underway to support ELLs with instruction. Uh, what is the goals to identify who's having those concerns? How are you tracking it? And how are you gonna continue to, to support them? as they enter the, the remaining part of the school year. Council Member Lewis, thank you for your question. Uh, multilingual learners are of the utmost importance to us. And I just wanna quickly delineate a few things that we have been doing. So the Division of Multilingual Learners has uh, in part of the, the discussion that I shared around priority standards and curricular materials has also been um, uploading and available for all teachers information that are specifically supporting students with different um, levels of English language acquisition. Uh, sometimes it's known as our nicest lat levels in the state. And the, some of that has also been in um, Spanish as well in terms of bilingual programs. We are working to ensure more languages, but that is also part of how we are ensuring that our, our bilingual learn, learners and ELLs have access to the curriculum and to learning. 
Um, as you may know, because of the pandemic, the state um, made some changes with identification of our English language learners. So we have worked very closely with schools to make sure that we can identify who those students are and to ensure that there's funding to support them. On tracking um, our ELLs, our multilingual learners, um, as you may know, every year, generally in the spring, uh, there's the nice and slat exam that's given to determine the level that the students are in terms of their English proficiency. And then um, instruction is matched to that level. And so because we don't have that information from last year, our, our Division of Multilingual Learners has also been offering professional learning to support teachers and being able to identify, even without that test, if you will, how do they look for the characteristics of where students are in the development of um, English and their academic language, and then providing supports to differentiate for that. All right, I thank you for that response. I don't think that it's um, whatever it is that you guys are doing right now, it's not working. I hear from principals from schools where students speak Urdu or Creole, um, even some kids that speak Yiddish and they're not getting the support they need from the administration. So they're very dependent on volunteers to come in and support their, their children. So I think uh, you guys should consider another approach because it's not working. And we're really, really um, putting these kids in a detrimental place. The second question I had was in regards to students with disabilities. There was a hearing that Chair Traeger had last year where we heard about students with disabilities who were turned away from learning bridges. So I wanted to get an update because we never received that report back from you guys. And you all said that you would provide us with that information. I wanted to know what resources were being provided to those that were turned away what is the new approach now and what do those resources look like and has it expanded um, to all the five boroughs? Thank you. Um, to just finish up on the multilingual question, uh, we, we hear your concern, the Urdu example is a good one that connects to um, other questions I was not able to complete answering. But that is where we are trying to leverage also the online opportunity to teach students in multiple schools because if you have a good Urdu teacher, which is also hard to find, as, as you were noting, then more students can benefit. So that's some work that, that is certainly underway. Regarding students with disabilities and learning bridges, we have been working with um, the city agencies that run it. Um, obviously, we are a partner in this effort. And that is a concern that we have heard quite a bit about in terms of making sure that students get uh, the kinds of services and supports that they need. And we're Time sure expired. Um, I don't have an update for you right now, but I just want to check to double check to see if uh, any of my colleagues have an update on that front. I do not. I, do, I don't have an update, but Mr. Chair, I would love to go back if you would allow me 35 seconds to Councilman, Councilmember Barron's um, question. 35 seconds, 30 seconds even. Just in terms of the compensation that she asked for, and as she was uh, speaking, I was making notes and have been heartened by um, many of the visits that we've been making around the city, both virtually and in person. Principals right now are doing things and making uh, strides, taking strides to do things as simple as looping of classes so that students have the familiarity both with their classmates and in some instances with teachers if they are looped. And we'll continue that going into the immediate future. Many principals that I'm speaking to have uh, uh, increased their coaching cycles of teachers because the council, uh, council member Barron asked for a comprehensive, more of a comprehensive uh, view. There's the coaching cycles that are going going on with uh, teachers. There are small groups that have been formed. I've witnessed kindergarten students going into small group in a virtual setting using a platform and being able to manipulate and also receive the services. I've seen this in middle school. Uh, there, are, there are, in addition to the small groups, there's this uh, conscious and continued effort to continue building community, which you know is very important as well because that's part of the movement and improvement of of uh, making up for the lost time 
uh, feeling confident and secure. Superintendents continue to make visits as uh, uh, Dr. Chen and I make visits. Superintendents make visits and uh, to provide feedback, to provide support. We then also can allocate additional human resource by way of professional uh, coaching and also even some on the ground uh, support in hands of uh, model teaching where, where necessary. Uh, middle school, I want to call out middle school in District 29, 355, where they do Saturday, right now, Saturday, virtual after school, Saturday um, academy and virtual after school tutoring uh, for the students to begin to uh, address some of the learning gains that we need to uh, ensure that we uh, we meet. There, is, there, we are looking at uh, revamping of advisories. A school I went to, where they revised the advisory to ensure that students were both getting the support uh, academically as well as the social wellness. So I know you're appropriately looking for Council Member Barron uh, uh, an overall plan. We are we are in the midst of formulating plans that will be concretized. However, I want to assure you that right now we have schools all across the city engaging in things that uh, you are looking to hear more about in, a, in, in one little package, uh, an important package, but we are doing the things, with, we are making strides to thinking about summer planning. Uh, we are thinking about how summer planning can look different, should be different, will feel different. We are connecting, uh, our principals are now making plans to connect with parents in a different way. The parent university is one of the modalities, but we also have something as simple as a Google Voice number where a principal told me that it rings in different uh, you know on different phones simultaneously allowing for parents to have the access and the con and the contact that they really want so this compensation for student learning loss is is as you know more it's in, it's involved and involves parents teachers students administrators uh city council and we are taking those steps and making those leaps right now we're not waiting we're doing it right now so that we have a sense of readiness for when we come back to what may be considered more of a new normal and i hope that gives you more of uh, a response Chair, could Christina Forty be unmuted to answer um, Council Member Lewis's question about learning bridges? Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just wanted to quickly say to Council Member Farah, we appreciate the, the question about learning bridges. One of the concerns that we were hearing about support of students with disabilities and learning bridges was access to paraprofessionals. We've very recently worked out a mechanism to help uh, get that support for students who require paraprofessional to attend learning bridges. Um, that is the major concern I've been hearing uh, from families about um, learning bridges and students with disabilities. I just wanted you to know that that's something that we've worked out. Uh, th thank you. Uh I just also want to just note that uh, because we're allowing Council Member Riley ask second round questions, we'll open it up to other members if they wish to have um, second round uh, questions. Uh, but we'll, we will begin with Council Member Riley. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my second uh, question that I had was, uh, we heard a lot about the mental and behavioral support that our children will need uh, when things get back to normal. Um, the last item on the 2021 uh, student achievement plan uh, seems to speak to this. And I just want to know, how do we intend on paying for this effort? And how would the increase in expenditures due to health screenings, planning, and delivery of services be funded? And which barriers will prevent us from maximizing reimbursement? Council, if we can uh, unmute Chief Administrative Officer Lauren Siciliano. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, as I've mentioned, we have been uh, able this year to prioritize funding for our students and for reopening, um, but it's uh, 
certainly clear that the pandemic has had a, an extraordinarily detrimental effect on uh, on our budget and on the city's budget. Um, and uh, I want to thank you, Chair Traeger, and the entire council for your your partnership and advocacy on this topic. Um, and we are um, quite challenged by the fact that to date the state and federal response has not matched the, the severity of the crisis. Um, and as we look ahead to the new year uh, and new federal leadership, we are hopeful that we will get additional stimulus and um, uh, particularly additional aid directly to localities. Um, All right, Lauren, uh, just for the sake of time, I just want to um, ask another question. The special sure. education student enforcement system, is there any um, status on the effort um, of replacing that? I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? The uh, special the, ed yeah, the time expired. Special education student information system. Ah, yes. Yeah, is there any um, status on replacing it? Um, Sorry, I heard the word enforcement and that's uh, where you lost me. Um, yes, so uh, we released uh, an RFP to replace that system. Um, at, as a reminder, we did that in two stages. So we did a stage one where um, we received proposals, reviewed them, and then did uh, proofs of concept, essentially uh, demos with vendors, and then shortlisted a group of vendors for a round two, which we released in, um, in early October. Um, so those uh, respondents who were shortlisted for the second round are currently being reviewed uh, for final selection. Okay, and Chair, if I could just give my sentiments on um, the feeling of students. Uh, yes, absolutely, please. We're gonna talk about mental and behavioral support. I think we really need to focus on not failing our students and, and because we've been failing them throughout this entire pandemic. Um, it's been very challenging and everyone here is an advocate you know, for our students. But if we're gonna talk about that support, I think we need to revisit failing any of our students being that a lot of them don't have adequate services, um, Wi-Fi or um, devices, you know, to, to be educated. So I just wanted to emphasize that um, what Chair Chager um, brought up earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Riley. And, and I, and I want to kind of uh, add to that a little bit um, because I think Councilmember Barron, Councilmember Riley, others, Lewis, have, have really raised very important points about um, how best to support our students and, and what is the plan ahead now and, and ahead. To me, and I think I had spoke to Dr. Chen previously about this, I'm gonna emphasize the word connection. And it is more critical than ever that we increase, uh, double down on connections to our students and connections to our students are more than just in a classroom uh, with, with the textbook. Um, you know, I, I, I repeat the story that I shared where I taught in Utrecht with Anthony Ramos, uh, a student that the system labeled as underperforming, who now is one of the top performers globally, quite frankly. Um, but he mentioned a, a baseball team and he mentioned the performing arts program, how those were connections to his school community. And this is where we need to, as we're taking stock of the needs of our kids and their trauma, the learning loss and, and, and finding ways to connect to them, more ways, deep in connections, more ways than ever. This is where the issue of equity really, where rubber meets the road, because there are still schools to this day that are, you know, uh, that have the, the added resources, whether it's a, a million dollar PTA whether it's alumni associations that could raise a lot of money or private resources, um, that they have all those extra, we call them extra, I actually think that they're a really integral part of a school community, um, uh, whether it's the arts, music, uh, sports, um, they're very much weaved into the fabric of a school culture. In the Utrecht High School, sports coaches checked in on their students in my class to make sure that they were scoring well and doing well on, on, on their grades. There were mentors to kids. In many cases, the coaches kept kids in school. Um, and so, but I know for a fact that not every school community has access to the resources of all these critical programs that do make a difference and do help establish connections and, and, and maintain connections, vital connections, uh, and that really add to a school culture. 
So Dr. Chen and Deputy Chancellor and others can weigh in. Uh, are, there, are there plans in place as we're trying to take stock of the needs of our kids right now? And as we are aggressively trying to meet their needs, and I know that a lot of this comes down to budget, but we're in budget season now. We have a new, we have a new federal administration that just got sworn in, thank goodness. And, and we have, uh, you know, uh, we have to now hold Albany accountable. We have to hold City Hall accountable to get resources because this is not going to be a normal year in any shape or form. And we can't use conventional ways of thinking about how to rise to the moment. And so are there conversations, are there plans, are there actionable plans in place uh, with resources? And, and tell me where you need them because we'll fight for them to give our students, particularly kids who are underserved, shortchanged at this moment without the multi-million dollar PTAs and, and alumni and private resources, to give them those opportunities as far as arts and music and uh, sports programs, all of the things that we know help establish connections and build a strong school culture to connect kids to their school communities. I, I, I'd be happy to hear any thoughts on that. Chair, you've expressed something that is, is incredibly essential. Um, the arts, physical education are also core subjects. I know sometimes people don't see it that way. Um, and those are incredibly important in supporting our young people and we do, and I, I want to pivot to Lauren Siciliano in a few minutes on this, but we do need to ensure that there's funding to support um, robust programming, right? I think about some of the things that Councilmember Barron spoke to about after school. Some of this after school is not just about, you know, the, the, the hardcore academic subjects, right? But it's also that connection, that sense of using uh, project-based learning also that every student should have, um, and not just for most privileged communities, and being able to um, be able to engage with venues across the city. So those are things that I do think we need um, resources for, robust programming that every student deserves. Lauren, do you want to talk a little bit more about fair student funding and, and such? Yes, absolutely. Um, I would just uh, add, building off uh, what I had shared earlier, um, this is why we are so appreciative of, of past advocacy um, and offers of current and future advocacy, um, because to do all of those things that we know are so critical, we absolutely need additional federal stimulus dollars and we need additional funding directly to localities. Um, we're reviewing the federal stimulus proposal, the federal stimulus legislation, um, as well as uh, President-elect, now President Biden's um, uh, stimulus plan. Uh, but in order to be able to do uh, everything that you've outlined, we absolutely need an infusion of additional stimulus dollars. I, I think we we need to um, put a number to, to the to the to the request because um, that's how we know what to fight for. I know the fair student funding issue is still very important because fair student funding is what you know, funds our educators, our social workers, our counselors, it's what funds our school budgets. But I do think that we need to look at the decision. I appreciate Dr. Chen, your recognition that these are not extras. These are not sort of throw-ins. These are really important parts of, of a school community, those that have them, quite frankly, because not every school has those opportunities. Um, I also wanna make clear that as we're pushing for more uh, uh, federal and state aid, New York State cannot repeat what they did last year, where they used uh, federal money and basically deducted that amount in state funds to the city of New York. The federal government had an allocation of about $700 million for city schools. The state basically removed $700 million in aid to the city school system last year during our greatest moment of need. Think about that for a moment when we hear about being New York tough and New York smart and New York love. Think about that for a moment. You remove $700 million from New York City school children going through the most challenging time in, in modern city history. You deduct 
close to a billion dollars. When you already owe our children money, you deduct another almost billion dollars on top of that. So I am not gonna be lectured about New York tough and New York love. You put your money where your mouth is. And we need to fight not just for a recovery, but an equitable recovery. Because as Councilman Barron always teaches and reinforces us in the council, everyone says they're in the same boat, but there are some folks drowning and there are some folks high up uh, at the top level of the cruise. And we need to be mindful that all of our children, every kid from every zip code, their needs have to be met. And I think that for me, finding baseline is different for, for, for different groups of kids. As I, I want to share with my colleagues, it's very important to get out. People ask me, Chair Traver, how do you know about some of the issues happening in our school system you know, on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I speak to school communities almost on a daily basis where educators shared with me that our kids needed access to hot meals. And I thank the DOE for moving in the direction of giving hot meals to our kids. But our students, they need more connections, more than hot meals. They, they need more than a device. They need more than internet. We need a plan right now, an actionable plan right now to help take stock of the needs. And it's more than just academic, it's the social, it's the emotional. Our schools are not just schools, they are lifelines, social safety nets in our school communities. This pandemic has proven this once and for all, how vital our schools are. Every school should be a community school. Every school should be a community school. Open even after school hours for after school programs and even programs for adult education to help parents and families trying to get back on their feet and with, with additional education opportunities and job opportunities. So we need to, I'm not looking to, how do we go back to, to, to last February? No, 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 we're moving forward and we're not gonna accept crumbs as an answer. Uh, now I, I saw that Councilor Cornegy has his hand up and be mindful of that. Councilor Cornegy, do you, you wanna ask a few questions? Time starts now. I think Council Member Cornegy may have stepped out. Is Council Member Levin here? <clears throat> I am chair. Thank you. Um, uh, and I apologize if, if the um, other members have asked this question already. Um, I want to talk a moment about um, uh, children residing in shelter. Um, um, I know that the mayor has announced um, outfitting all shelters with Wi-Fi, um, I believe by the end of FY21. Um, obviously, that does not do anything to meet the needs that they have between now and the end of this school year. Um, is every child in shelter um, uh, do they have access to, um, to a broadband, um, mobile device? I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, so, uh, we have prioritized the delivery of the iPads to the students in shelters. Um, the iPads can access either the cellular network or connect to Wi-Fi. Um, right. and we have been, uh, working with DSS. We surveyed all of the students in shelter um, to make sure that they could connect. Uh, there are some uh, areas of particular shelters where the T-Mobile signal is weak. And so for those uh, families, we swapped out the T-Mobile device with a, a Verizon device. carrier. Um, yeah. And um, we have continued to follow up. We have a dedicated help desk for students in shelter uh, to troubleshoot any issues that come up um, and are constantly working to, to resolve those issues um, as they're identified. Um, does, every, right. does every student in shelter have access to a Verizon or a functional, T-Mobile or Verizon, but a functional uh, mobile iPad of some kind? Do they have access to it? So it's it's a constant, it's very fluid. So, um, you know, issues constantly come into the help desk across our mm -hmm. system of uh, students who are struggling to connect. And there are all kinds of um, I mean, are students struggling to connect with, with, with Verizon devices, with, with Verizon wireless cellular iPads? So uh, there are many cases where once we did the swap, 
the students have been able to connect. And then in some instances, for example, um, based on the number of people trying to connect at any one time, or um, uh, you know, if there are if there's lead in the in the walls of the particular structure, that can all interfere with the signal. So we do get requests that come into the help desk or issues called in where a family mm -hmm. might still be struggling. And then we look at uh, different things that we can do to help either boost the signal um, or make sure that that student is getting what they need on a case-by-case -case basis. How about the 60,000 uh, backlog mobile devices? Are those all in the hands of students at this point? I know we spoke about that prior to the holidays. Yes, we ordered uh, in the fall an additional 100,000 devices. Those devices have all been delivered. Um, we've also ordered another 50,000 iPads uh, for new requests that are coming in and to help meet needs over the course of the year. Okay, so all of, sorry, so all of those 100,000 then have, are in the hands of students. Correct, all were delivered, yes. Um, are, there, are there students that are still in need of devices? Yes, so we have some requests that have come in in recent weeks, about 5,800. Um, and as I mentioned, we had already ordered 50,000 iPads, so we have already started shipping out devices to those students. Okay. Uh, why would they have requested devices so, so far along in, in the pandemic? So uh, the device needs are, are very fluid. A student may have access to a device one day and then not have it the next, either because <laughs> um, a family member needed it, um, you know, mom or dad went back to work, needed the device, a uh, sibling mm -hmm. needed it, or um, their personal device broke, um, or it's outdated and couldn't host a particular application. So that's why it's, it's fluid. Okay. Um, um, okay, those, those are the, um, I mean, I'm just most particularly concerned about this um, students in shelter um, being that, uh, you know, the mayor's commitment to a Wi-Fi uh, build out is, um, I mean, in talking, I said this, the general welfare committee and talking to uh, providers, um, uh, so, you know, <clears throat> uh, homeless services providers, um, you know, doing a, a fit out of, in, for Wi-Fi for some shelters is a very arduous task. It's not the kind of thing so having that, uh, you know, that, that stop gap between now and then that's, that's really vital. So, um, uh, I guess the last question, do we have enough <clears throat> of the Verizon SIM cards? Do we still have Verizon SIM cards on hand if, if, if yes. you need to swap them out? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I would also add, um, uh, in terms of the Wi-Fi work that the city is doing, there is a group of, I believe, about 25 shelters that were prioritized first to be done this winter. Um, so mm -hmm. many of those sites have already been completed and are being completed now. So much. Sure. Thank you, Councilmember Levin. And uh, I see that we've been rejoined by Councilmember Cornegy. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, Chair. Uh, thank you so much for convening this hearing and being the voice of parents across the city as it relates to issues around uh, education. Um, I, so, very famously, I'm a parent of six children uh, and I've had a child in every facet of the Department of Education school system. I'll remind everybody that I've had a, I've had a child who's gotten his GED, a child with an EEP, IEP, a child was, that's in gifted and talented, and three children in, in charter. Um, and I know how important it is for us to begin the conversation around returning uh, to schools and schools buildings. Uh, I'm confused though, um, is, it, is it true as I'm being told um, as a parent uh, that the same protocols put in place for, for traditional DOE students are not the same protocols around COVID-19 testing and tracing for uh, students who are in uh, the charter networks, even if they are in, you know, sharing the same buildings? Council member, I would ask if uh, Katie generally can be unmuted for this response. I just want to make sure I understand your question, Councilman. Are you asking if they have to comply with the same health and safety protocols? No, I'm asking if um, they have they're following or covered by the same testing and tracing tracing regimen, even if they're not sharing, even if they're sharing a building. It's my understanding that the the the, the tracing uh, regimen that's going to protect our students in the future and faculty 
is not the same regiment that um, the, the charter networks are following. Okay, so anybody that uses DOE space, including charters that use our space, have to comply with our health and safety protocols, including contact tracing. Charter schools who use DOE facilities must, like DOE schools, call positive case, confirmed cases into the situation room. And those principals must work with staff in the situation room, including the test and trace team there uh, to investigate the case and, and take the interventions needed. So that, that they must comply with those. It's, it's not true that they are, they, have to. are they outside of the resources? Are they given the same resources that in any DOE building um, uh, that, that, that uh, a DOE operated, traditionally operated school would receive? For, for tracing? Yeah. Tracing is done by the situation, by the TIS and trace team in the situation room. So their staff must work with the um, uh, team there. And that is the same as it is for the DOE. I don't, maybe I'm not understanding what you mean by additional resources. Meaning, meaning for example, um, there, were, there, were, there is a, what do they call it? The um, ability to be randomly tested um, and, and, and those protocols that are in place, are they, do they follow the same protocol. Um, and, and obviously my question is, how do we stay safe in a building where there are two different sets of protocols for the same, the same kids in different programs? I, I see. So you're talking about the in-school testing? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. They are eligible to be in-school tested as well. Uh, the testing providers, when they come to the schools, they do test, uh, you know, a certain percentage of the school, so they don't test everybody. So it's possible that they may not do a uh, charter staff or charter student every single time, but they are eligible to be part of that, yes. So how do we ensure though that everyone in that building, no matter what program they're in, is a part of that as a safety, just as a safety measure and a safety precaution? So you have to remember that not everybody gets tested every single week or two weeks or what have you. Uh, it is a certain percentage of the building every time. Uh, testing providers work with uh, schools, uh, facilities to uh, work up those lists every week and, and make sure that there is a variety. And if you have a specific site where that uh, doesn't seem to be happening, I'd be happy to work with you and figure out what's going on there and work with my colleagues uh, at health and hospitals who run the test and trace process and the testing to figure out what's going on there. So I, I, I just want to make sure. So the, the, the resources in the situation room are available to both traditional DOE school uh, students and administrators and charter um, students and administrators, the situation room. Yes, as long as they are in a DOE facility. If a charter is in private space, they are not obligated to follow our protocols in the same way, but if they are in a shared uh, DOE, or not even a shared, just a DOE facility, they would be required to, yes, and they would have access to that, absolutely. Okay, so, so where we find that it's not happening or for whatever reason, we should reach out to your office. Yes, I'm happy to, to follow up with you about that. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilman Cornegie. Um, I don't see any uh, further hands, but I, I, I will just um, end on just one final uh, question. Or the the issue of um, finding baseline and whether it's now and and moving ahead. Um, what do we know at this point, Dr. Chan or Deputy Chancellor? Or anyone could answer. What do we know at this point? from the state of New York, NYSED, um, uh, and uh, also want to congratulate uh, Dr. Young, the new, the new um, we have a new commissioner chancellor, so I just want to note that for the, st for the state. Uh, but um, what do we know at this point about state assessments? Um, and for both this existing school year and the plan to find baseline into the summer and, and folks planning already ahead uh, into September. So Chair, uh, so far, um, as we know, last year they canceled uh, th three through eight exams in math, science, uh, and also regents. They have only waived so far the January regents. Uh, but aside from that, they have, are still asking us to tentatively schedule to be prepared to administer assessments April through June, which would typically include uh, the ELA math, science, and regents. So that's what we know so far from the state. Um, 
I think to many of the points you've raised, we don't want to rely, I mean, that's information we've relied on for years as one piece of information that we don't have. We don't want to rely on how that happens and we need to make sure that we also have a baseline across the system. So right now we are looking at a number of different uh, low stakes uh, formative and diagnostic assessments. Um, and part of that, um, there are final decisions at this point, but part of what we're doing is making sure that we are looking at what schools already are using and to be able to leverage uh, the best available so that we can move to uh, some universal types of assessments to be able to have baseline. Again, um, it's important to us that these be low stakes assessments because they really are to inform uh, instruction and the types of resources that students need, particularly students that need it the most. So if I'm hearing you correct, New York State is at this point still considering uh, state assessments for April? They have, um, you know, I think we know also, depending on what happens today in the first administration federally, um, the state is, is compelled to follow federal guidelines, especially as it relates to funding uh, around the assessment. And so that is part of the information that they are also waiting for as well. Um, but uh, we, they want us to be ready to be able to um, administer assessments in the event that uh, we continue to, continue to need to do that. So they have not said uh, that we are not giving them yet. So, I mean, we, we just spent a good part of this hearing talking about trying to take stock of the depths of learning loss and impact, which we know exists. And it's, uh, I, I, I don't know how all of our children, I know some children with who, you know, maybe from some wealthier zip codes in New York City who have the means to have five days a week in person in, in a private learning pod, which many kids have and have never had any interruption. But many of our kids have not been afforded the opportunity of a private learning pod. Um, I, has there been any uh, lobbying of the state, any discussions with the state about um, different forms of uh, of trying to find baseline data that does not do irreparable harm to our students? We, we continually engage with the state and, you know, they are, uh, and I, I don't want to speak for them, but I think they're in a difficult situation as well uh, in terms of federal funding and federal regulations. Um, we will continue to partner with them, but to your point, we want to take action as a system, right? We want to make sure that regardless of what the state does or does not do, we want to take action and responsibility for that baseline information, which is why the mayor and the chancellor made that as part of the announcement a few weeks ago. Has there been any lobbying or discussions with our federal officials? Senator Schumer, who's the incoming majority leader, do you, are you aware of any of those conversations? I cannot speak to that personally. Um, I don't know if other colleagues on the call uh, would like to do that. But certainly if it hasn't been done yet, just because I know everyone's not unmuted, um, you're right, that, that's, that's work that will continue to occur with um, our IGA folks. Yeah, Dr. Chen, I, the, the, the challenge before our federal officials must be how to bring home resources to meet the needs of all of our kids and not to just perpetuate standardized testing. Um, and we, you know, Senator Schumer is from Brooklyn, New York, and he is going to be, uh, you know, he is, he is a very influential person in the Congress. And, uh, you know, we, I think we need to make our case immediately. Um, and also just note for the record, as I mentioned in previous hearings, we have consortium schools in New York City that are absolved from state, uh, region state assessments, and they do project-based assessments. And kids, from what I saw, witnessed it very well. And so there already is a model to find other forms of data without standardized exams 
Um, we, you know, former Chancellor Farina had an expression, that I, I quote her, uh, the answer is always in the room. And, you know, I, I think that this is something that we can also find internally. Uh, but, but with that, I, I'm just going to, um, uh, I'll pause here. I, I don't see any additional questions, but uh, if you can kind of get back to me in some of the, some of the re requests for information that I've made, um, because I think we need to kind of really flesh out um, this plan for, for the short term and for the long term to take stock of the needs of our kids and to provide them with meaningful and equitable resources um, to really move our school system forward. And I thank the panel for their time here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Chair. For the record, we've also been joined by Councilmember Levin, Levin and Councilmember Carnegie. We will now turn to public testimony. Once more, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearing, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist use the raised hand function in Zoom, and you will be called on after each panel has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the surgeon at arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. All testimony will be limited to two minutes. Please wait for the surgeon to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Written testimony can be submitted to testimony at council.nyc.gov. The first panel, panelist will be Tita Dukara, Wilhelmina Amoa from the Brotherhood Sister Soul, Mom, Ma'am Fatu Dukare from the Brotherhood Sister Soul, and John Paul Infante from the Brotherhood Sister Soul. First, we will be hearing from Tina, Tita, and I apologize in advance if I mispronounce people's names. Oh, hi, it's Tita. Okay. Time starts now. My name is Tita Ducre, and I am a young organizer of the Brotherhood and Sister Soul and a senior at Democracy Prep Harlem High School. Students like me are stressed and exhausted over the college application process, school projects, homework, and other extracurricular activities. Teachers are giving us more work and sort of deadlines to complete assignments since COVID started. I am currently taking three AP classes, biology, English, and cal calculus, and a college sociology prep course. These classes require a lot of reading, note taking and studying. Good grades require time and additional help from teachers, but now technology gets in the way and my teachers are harder to find. When a website crashes, I cannot complete assignments. When teachers change the format of a website, I cannot see past assignments to use that to study for future tests. When I am having technology or internet issues, I am barely able to participate and learn. Considering COVID, some solutions that can be implemented to lessen the pressures on students include ensuring that students who need assistance get it in a way they need, assigning less homework because we are already teaching ourselves and now we are working twice as much with less time given household responsibilities, requiring teachers to have longer office hours with space for more students, adjust the graduation requirement for seniors like me includes removing regions requirement because we cannot take them. We are struggling to survive and the pandemic has made it more difficult. There needs to be realistic and healthy expectation of students so that the cost we pay for graduating after spending our entire time year learning remotely won't affect us. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll be hearing from Wilhelmina. Time starts now. My name is Wilhelmina Amoa and I am a young, I'm a youth organizer of the Brotherhood Sister Soul. 
To address issues worsened by COVID-19, we have to find money to create meaningful shifts in our education system and instead create pathways to student success. This will require police-free schools. Failure to divert from school police and invest in student success will mean that our city continues to fail as youth. Today, New York City is far from where it needs to be to ensure student success as our school face troubling realities. School, get, school segregations leads to chronic underfunding of schools in New York State, which, were, which has negative and disparate impacts for Black, Latinx, and low-income students given subsequent resource and disparities. Only 77.3% of the 1.1 million children in the DOE system will graduate on time, and only 55% of NYC high school student graduates will graduate college ready. One in 10 NYC public school students is homeless. Additionally, in a nation in which 14 million students are in school with police with no, but no counselor, nurse, psychologist, or social worker, New York City has more school safety agents than any other school district in the US. The presence of police in our schools has disproportionately impacted students who are low-income Black and Latinx, who are more likely to be subject of exclusionary discipline and police response at schools than their white peers. Everyone in city council, however, has the power to shift this beginning with meaningful shift funds from the police, reforming their responsibilities and reinvesting in our communities. We must de-stress the, the school to prison pipeline and end broken windows policing. True, truly decriminalize low level offenses that lead to our youth having negative contact, contact with the state and carceral systems. And we must do this now. Our vision for education in New York City includes safe, restorative, healing environments where all students have the opportunity to learn and grow. To meet this goal, we must pursue po policies that value that and respect the dignity of, of students, caregivers, and their communities. This requires providing schools equitable res resources, adopting a cultural responsive curriculum, preventing trauma, repairing harm, and pro promoting restorative practices. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Ma'am Fatu. Um, my name is Ma'am Fatu. I am sharing on the behalf of youth at the Brotherhood and Sister Soul. There is a little understanding of how stressful virtual learning is in a pandemic. It is because no one has experienced this before. No one but us. I am here to say that students' mental health is being negative, negatively negatively impacted like never before and failure to resolve this puts us in a further damage. City council members must advocate on behalf of students and increase the budget of student support staff. As a senior, I've been ashamed by teachers when I ask for additional support. I am less success in in, in I am less success into um, individual learning support than I need, that I really need. As a graduate, as a graduate, as my grades suffer, my parents become more, more disappointed, and I feel as through my college application ap acceptance are in danger. I am further disservice, dis and I'm when I'm unable to success access private tutors, and they previous previously scheduled to make up work are canceled and prevent me, preventing me from improving my grades. Moreover, students like me who previously had extra time for exam are not being granted this. And it's leading many of us random filling out answers to finish by the alternate time, especially when multiple tests are given in, a, in one day. We are not robots, and our school neglect on divergent students to, and students with different type of learning and and with disability. To many, to many, our Sorry. school to better our school to better our school. We need a great teacher and small classrooms. We also need to stop. We also need to stop student testing for tutors and mental support staff to hire more counselors, therapists, therapists, and to hire more counselor therapy and student support staff to help all students 
especially those who are falling behind and struggling with mental and emotional. Thank you for listening. Please do more than just hear me. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from John Paul. Time starts now. Hi, my name is John Paul Infante, and I'm a liberation program facilitator and organizer of the Brotherhood Sister Soul. As a former New York City public school student and former high school teacher, I've experienced the inequities of the public education system long before COVID-19. The burden black and brown students, their families, teachers, and school administrators have been forced to endure because of poor responses by superintendents and school district is par for the course. The reality black and brown students and teachers of color face in the classroom is rarely if ever considered when these decisions are made. The process of entering school should not resemble the process of entering a prison. Policing black and brown children is criminal. Before COVID-19, black and brown public school students were policed, stopped and frisked by school safety officers if the coins in their pockets set off the metal detectors on their way to first period. Before COVID, while many black and brown public school students were being suspended and expelled, their white counterparts in specialized and private schools were treated with the gentleness youth deserves. Now, creating a safe, restorative, and healing environment for all New York City's public school students means police schools that prioritizes healing, led by educators centering trauma-informed approaches and culturally responsive education armed with an equitable distribution of technological resources to all students and translation for all families. More student support staff will make it so that educators of colors can teach while professionals address their students' traumas and recognize unsafe home environments. Every child is entitled to a free and appropriate public education that centers their experience and, is, and it is the responsibility of the world's wealthiest city that they have access to computers, Wi-Fi, and any other resources. I'm expired. Including food in order to ensure this. Anything less is a crime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of the panelists. Council members, If remember, if you have any questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function to ask questions for this panelist. This panel, I'll turn it to Council Member Chair. Trager, if he has any questions. Just want to uh, thank our amazing students, educators. Once you're a teacher, always a teacher. Uh, I appreciate, we, we do have more work to do. It's not just about listening, it's about acting. Uh, but this is about shaping decisions because these hearings, as we've shown before, do absolutely shape uh, action. And we have a lot more work to do. And we appreciate you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing that no council members have their hand raised, I will now turn it to our next panel, which will be Mary Vaccaro from UFT. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Mary Vaccaro. I serve as the Vice President of Education for the United Federation of Teachers and the Executive Director of the UFT Teacher Center. On behalf of the union's more than 200,000 members, I'd like to thank Chairperson Traeger and all the members of City Council Committee on Education for holding this important hearing. The UFT has been working since last March to improve remote instruction for both educators and students. Our tech support helped literally thousands of teachers set up their Google Classrooms last March and holding Zoom workshops this fall on how to best use remote teaching tools to improve instruction. The UFT and its professional development operation, our teacher center, has been helping educators and students and their families navigate remote teaching and learning. The reality is that too often we have been doing this work solo without a viable partner in the New York City Department of Education. Although the DOE prepared lengthy guidance and documents with descriptions of different models and digital learning tools, few teachers I speak with have even seen the documents, raising serious questions about the DOE's efforts at communication and dissemination. The few who have reported a disconnect between the, what the DOE provides and their curriculum used in schools. Over the summer, the DOE asked for a new position, a virtual content specialist who could create grade, grade and subject specific virtual classroom, virtual education. 
We agreed to this position. This position was a vital necessity. Only now is the DOE interviewing accomplished educators to fill this post, which has been in discussion for five months. So the UFT through its teacher center attempts to fill the gap. New York City educators are thirsty for help. A workshop about English language acquisition, which is something that has been talked about today, filled up with a thousand educators within one day of the registration being open. Since school started this September, the teacher center has I'm provided expired. 300 hours of professional development to over 8,000 teachers, paras, and support staff. The UFT recognizes that parents are under great stress, and we've also provided Saturday workshops for our students. We will continue to provide our educators, students, and families what they need, and we know that the council will be a vital partner in this work, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. This is a right, another reminder for council members, if you have questions for this panel, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no hands raised, I will now call on the next panel. The next panel will be Kavari Sengupta from the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families and Holly Smoltza from the Coalition for Hispanic Family Services. First, we will be hearing from Kavari. Kavari, you may begin after the surgeon. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Kaveri Sangupta, and I am the Education Policy Coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, or CACF, the nation's only Pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization leading the fight for improved and equitable policies, systems, funding, and services. Thank you to Chair Traeger and members of the Committee on Education for giving us this opportunity to testify. Excellent remote education is absolutely imperative for the APA community since so many of our students are fully remote. APA students comprise only 11.5% of all students in grades 3K to 5 and District 75 who opted for in-person learning in December, when they make up 18% of all students enrolled in those grades. Moreover, nearly 60% of all Asian American students opted for fully remote learning in October, the highest share of all ethnic groups. Students in our own student leadership program, the Asian American Advocacy Project, have reported feeling deeply unmotivated, but note that their grades may not reflect the sentiment. They bring up an important point. Traditional grades do not necessarily reflect the academic health of a student in terms of their interest, engagement, or critical thinking. These stories expose a pressing concern. Schools may not be truly cultivating students' love of learning at this time, which could very much impact their lives after they leave the school system. To truly understand our students' academic needs, we need DOE to collect and make transparent, accurate data and disaggregation of data on the academic outcomes of students by ancestry group, gender, home language, L status, ability, and socioeconomic status. We need them to provide the ability to cross-reference between categories and to analyze disparities in these data. Lumping all APA students together as though the community is a monolith is, deep, is a deeply flawed practice that perpetuates the harmful minority myth because it ignores the disparate impact that COVID-19 has very likely had on pockets of our community. APA students including, but not limited to, those from underrepresented ethnic and language backgrounds and those with families facing linguistic isolation due to requiring services in low incidence languages may be experiencing pronounced academic difficulties during Time due to the pandemic, but are rendered invisible system-wide within aggregated data, which is entirely unfair to them in their learning. DOE must also provide uh, tools and strategies for instruction of ELLs, multilingual learners, and students with disabilities who generally find that remote learning does not suit their needs and ensure that educators implement them. Even if these professional development opportunities are being offered, unfortunately, our families are not seeing them being utilized in the classroom. As we continue to live in a COVID world, we must be sure to center all of our decisions on our most marginalized students. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Holly. Time starts now. A mentor once reminded me that any one person can be a change maker in any other person's life. The more positive role models a young person has in their corner, the greater the opportunity for the young person to meet a change maker. Fair Futures coaches and tutors have been these change makers for over 1,000 young people in foster care in New York City throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Good afternoon. My name is Holly Smeltzer. I am a New York City foster parent. I am also the Fair Futures Program Director at the Coalition for Hispanic Family Services. Amidst the crisis, 
Fair Future's coaches, tutors, and support staff continue to help youth stay on track with academic and career goals, secure safe housing, provide emotional support, and much more. We still do not know the full implications of the COVID-19 pandemic on our youth as it relates to education. However, we do know that children across the city are struggling with the challenges of learning remotely. They do not have access to the technology, Wi-Fi, and other tools essential for learning, and they are struggling with stress, isolation, anxiety, and depression that this pandemic has created for so many of us. We also know that students with disabilities, students who are recent immigrants and English language learners, and students who are over age for their grade level represent those at risk of falling further behind because of the crisis. Now, consider a young person dealing with all of these challenges who represents one or more of these populations and is also in foster care. For a young person like this, young people like ours, Fair Futures is the connection, support, and lifeline they need now more than ever. As a member of the Fair Futures community and as a foster parent, I have witnessed firsthand the impact of the pandemic on our children. Fair Futures has stood with New York City foster youth through COVID-19, so these young people have the support they need to not only survive the crisis, but thrive. We must invest in our children now to ensure they have a fair shot at success Time later. expired. Fair Futures coaches, tutors, and support staff continue to be change makers in the lives of our young people so they themselves can become change makers for the next generation. Thank you so much to the chair and the council for this opportunity. Thank you. Seeing that no council members have their hand raised, I will now call on the next oh, council member. Levine has his hand raised. Calling on council member Levine for questions for this panel. I just wanted to thank um, Holly for the work that she does with uh, Fair Futures, which is a, a big priority for um, me in this upcoming budget as the chair of general welfare and, and the great work that um, um, the entire coalition has done. So um, I, I promise you and all of in the entire Fair Futures coalition that we'll do whatever we can to make sure that the funding is uh, not only protected, but also hopefully baseline um, so that uh, um, it's uh, protected in future years, um, future years, future council. So, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Levin. Now, calling on the next panel, which includes Randy Levine from Advocates for Children, Maggie Morrow from the Arise Coalition, Lori Podvesker from Include NYC, and Lainey Hammerson from Class Size Matters. First, we will be hearing from Brandy. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. My name is Randy Levine and I'm Policy Director of Advocates for Children of New York. Since last May, we've appeared before the council describing the immense barriers our clients have faced to learning during the pandemic, despite the hard work of many educators and DOE staff members. The road to recovery will be long, but with vaccines rolling out, $4.3 billion coming to New York State schools through the federal COVID-19 relief package passed in December, and a COVID-19 relief proposal from President Biden with more than double that amount of funding for schools, the city must bolster its efforts to plan for an ambitious COVID-19 educational recovery effort. In our limited time today, we would like to outline a few essential principles. The recovery effort must include targeted evidence-based instructional and social emotional approaches to address the learning loss and trauma students have experienced. The plan must have a focus on equity and be responsive to the disparate impact of the pandemic on communities of color and groups of students who struggled with remote learning. New supports or supplemental programming must be accessible to students who have struggled with remote learning, including those who have parents with low digital literacy or speak a language other than English. While remote programming may be part of the menu of options, the city must not rely on parents to serve as tutors for their children using a digital internet-based program after school hours. The recovery effort should include a summer school component that is open to students of all grades and has specialized supports for students with disabilities and ELDs. Such summer programs should include targeted supports, such as matching students who are struggling with reading with educators who are trained in evidence-based literacy interventions, building on work the city did last summer. 
The recovery effort must include a system for students with disabilities to get the compensatory instruction and services they have the legal right to receive without requiring individual families to file impartial hearings. And it must include specialized support for L's. I'm expired. For L's who went without the bilingual or English as a new language instruction, they have the right to receive. The recovery should emphasize evidence-based literacy instruction and intervention, and must also have a major emphasis on an investment in mental health support and trauma-informed care, with the city reimagining school safety, reallocating NYPD funding to support students, and ensuring students have access to staff who can help support their social, emotional, and behavioral needs in police-free schools. And the recovery effort must address the needs of both our youngest and oldest learners. It must ensure that students who have not been able to earn course credit get the support and time they need to make up the work, including students who would normally be forced to age out of school before they have turned because they have turned 21 years old. Just to say quickly, we are counting on the council to play a leadership role in shaping this education recovery package as the city budget process moves forward and to advocate for the city to get the federal and state resources needed, including ensuring the state does not offset any federal COVID-19 relief education funding with cuts in state education funding. We look forward to speaking with you more about each of these points and others and working with you to help ensure that the learning loss students have experienced does not have ripple effects for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Maggie. Time starts now. Good afternoon. I'm Maggie Moroff and I coordinate the Arise Coalition which is a group of several hundred parents, advocates, academics, educators, all advocating together for systemic changes to the day-to-day -day experiences and long-term outcomes for students with disabilities here in New York City's public schools. Um, I'm also the special educate, senior special education policy coordinator at Advocates for Children, where I work al alongside Randy. Um, today, I'm speaking on behalf of Arise. This past year, um, the many obstacles to instruction and achievement typically faced by our students have been magnified to unfathomable de degrees. That is despite all of the work of school-based and central DOE staff. We wanna use our limited time here today to call your attention to four areas of particular importance to our students um, as we move forward. So first, the need to considerably expand the literacy supports offered to students and to provide systemic evidence-based core instruction and appropriate interventions to ensure that students learn to read, especially in light of the tremendous learning loss that's taken place as a result of the pandemic. Second, the import of developing true partnerships with families, seeking ongoing input and development and inevitable to the in inevitable modifications to individual student special ed plans, um, that the DOE is currently using, known now as a program and related services adaptations documents. Third, the need to provide parents with real-time information about the supports and services their children are receiving pursuant to their IEPs. Parents need to know whether or not their children are now and continue to be offered the supports they require. And lastly, when it's safe for all children to return to school, the learning losses will be significant for all and magnified for those with the greatest needs, including students with disabilities. Arise members Time join with many other, voices here, many other voices here in calling for a well thought out, well resourced plan to assess the academic and social emotional damage done during COVID and to develop plans to address those for all students, including the over 200,000 students with disabilities here in the city. Such a plan must include the makeup instruction and services that students with disabilities have the legal right to receive. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Lori. Time starts now. Hi, everybody. My name is Lori Podfesker. I lead the policy work at and I'm also uh, uh, long worry, to there's, a there's a, can you hear me worry? Eighteen-year-old boy um, with his DINPAD program. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? 
Yes, Lori, we can, can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, Lori, can you can you can you say a sentence again, please? Sure. So I'm gonna start over, and I'm sorry about that. Uh, my name is Mary Vesker, and I lead the policy work at Include NYC. And I'm also mom to a very funny 18-year-old boy who attends District 75 program. Um, going to read testimony um, and echo a lot of what uh, Maggie and Randy have specifically said. Um, but want to emphasize more uh, about the uh, parent perspective. Um, and so um, during last spring, when New York City quickly became the epicenter of COVID-19 pandemic, the New York City school system was quickly and radically disrupted. School students face significant barriers as we pivot to full-time remote instruction. While some obstacles were outside of the city's control, many were not, and sadly are still obstructing. So Lori, we, um, you're still breaking up, so we are going to circle back to you, but if you don't mind to log off and log back on. Yeah, uh, if, if Lori can uh, log back on, I'll, we'll, I'll give her the full time again so she could restart. I, I'd like to hear her testimony, but uh, if, she, if she wants to log off and log back on, I'd be more than happy to accommodate. And if we want to move on to the next person, then we'll wait for Lori to do that. Yes, sure. So Lori, when you rejoin, we will um, circle back to you. But next, we'll be hearing from Lainey. Time starts now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you perfectly, Lainey. Great. Um, I want to thank you. Uh, my name is Lainey Hameson. I am the executive director of Class Size Matters. Uh, recent hearings in the New York Post, Wall Street Journal, and Gothamist have all reported that online class sizes this year have grown to excessive sizes. Unfortunately, the DOE failed to report on class sizes by November 15th as legally mandated. After you, Chair Traeger, I want to thank you for your letter, sending it to the Chancellor in October, pointing out how this reporting is especially important this year. Uh, the DOE responded that they would not release any class size data till December 31st. Um, December 31st came and went. Um, uh, on January 4th, I heard that they've delayed it more until earlier mid-January. It's now January 20th, and the data is still not posted. Um, in your original letter, Chair Traeger, you asked for the data to be disaggregated by online classes versus in-person classes. Otherwise, the averages are not that meaningful. Yet the Deputy Chancellor said they would not report on disaggregated class sizes until sometime in February. It's really difficult to understand why they couldn't do this by the deadline, especially because in October, Chancellor Carranza um, spoke at a press conference with the mayor and saying they... Uh, they uh, collect attendance data and this class size data literally every day in three buckets, in-person classes, remote blended learning classes and full-time remote classes. One has to suspect that the DOE just doesn't want people to know how large the class sizes are. We do have some data, however, it's in my written testimony, which I've sent to uh, you, Chair Traeger, as well as the staff uh, from a parent survey done by special support services in October um, of parents of students with special needs. It's disaggregated. Um, it shows many students in self-contained classes that are Time expired. To, to 12 to 15, um, as large as 30 to 38 and so on. Uh, obviously these class sizes are impossible to uh, provide kids with the, the services they need, the attention that they need. There are even ASD nest classes for autistic spectrum kids in classes 30 or more. So what should be done next year? Unfortunately, the chancellor has put forward a plan that double down, doubles down on online commercially de prepared digital assessments and curriculum, which are impersonal and mechanized. One would think that after the disaster of this year, he would know that students need more contact with actual teachers and human beings rather than less. 
Instead, with the help of federal and state funds, New York City schools should focus on two ways to make this happen. Class sizes should be reduced to as small a level as possible to provide the enhanced support to all students, but especially those whose education has suffered the most from the pandemic. And there needs to be an expanded tutoring system for, for our school based on the AmeriCorps model of national service. I hope that somebody asks um, the federal government, especially uh, Senator Schumer, there is a bill that has been introduced in Congress on the Senate side to provide millions of dollars to school districts across the country to provide this sort of in-person uh, tutoring. That's what the UK government is doing. That's what we need here in New York City as well. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Seeing that Lori has rejoined us, we'll now turn it back to Lori. Time starts now. Hi, thank you. And I apologize for that. Um, I'm on my third laptop since this pandemic started. Um, <laughs> so during last spring, when New York City quickly became the epicenter of the COVID pandemic, the school system was quickly and radically disrupted. Schools, teachers, and students faced significant barriers as we pivoted to full-time remote instruction. While some obstacles were outside of the city's control, many were not, and sadly are still obstructing teaching and learning almost a year later. More than 100,000 school professionals did not have the requisite skills nor access to evidence-based tools to effectively provide online instruction and special education services. As a result, very little specialized instruction was delivered throughout the city last spring and summer. This created additional learning barriers for students with disabilities in the system that was already failing our students. And the same issue still persists today in too many of our schools and classrooms. School student learning cannot occur if appropriate instruction is not delivered or cannot be accessed. It cannot occur if students with disabilities do not receive all or any of their related services and individualized support. It cannot occur if the city and schools don't provide families with consistent, clear, and timely information. I will say as a parent, there have been many days um, since the fall that I've had to tell my child's bus driver that there is no school. I get texted with a pickup time on mornings in which there is no school, which shows you the disconnect between um, information, as well as um, I do wanna point out, cause I think it's important that District 75 schools are parts of District 75 organizations. So for example, my son attends a District 75 school in a co-located building on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. His District 75 organization uh, is one of eight different sites. But as a result, we get communications about every single site within Time that organization. Expired. So it is typical on one day, like last night, to get six different emails about school closings um, for the organization. And now I'm a parent who does this full time for a living, and it took me days to figure this out. Um, and I just want to put that on people's radar because it's not okay. It, it, it could be a trigger for, for many families. Um, so I don't want to take up more time than I've already done, but I do want to say that part of our recommendations um, do include what Maggie and Randy said uh, with timelines. So we believe that the city should develop a citywide plan to address compensatory services by the end of the school year, June 30th. We believe that the city should disseminate guidance documents for schools on the implementation of the compensatory plan by the end of the summer before school starts. And we believe that every student should be reevaluated who has an IEP by the end of this calendar year, in addition to their annual review of IEP. We also believe there is a strong need for data uh, that we have heard council member Traeger uh, say many times. And thank you council member Traeger for all that you do for students with disabilities. And we also believe that there needs to be more funding and more school psychologists in District 75 programs, and that every District 75 organization should have their own um, guidance council, their own school psychologists. Um, because if we are gonna see an increase in students evaluated, the psychologists working in District 75 programs should have some kind of expertise on working with students with developmental disabilities and emotional um, challenges. Uh, it is incredible to me that my son first triennial has a, um, that there is a school psychologist from a local community school who is coordinating that. Um, and like 
my colleagues have said, we believe that we do need to create an accountability mechanism um, to measure social, emotional instruction and learning in schools. Um, thank you. Thank you. This concludes this panel. Seeing that no council members have their hand raised, I will now call on the next panel. The next panel will be Sandra Ascamilla from the Children's Aid, Abby Fernandez from the Children's Aid, and then Daryl Harnick Becker from the Citizens Committee for Children. First, we will be hearing from Sandra. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sandra Escamilla. I'm the Executive Vice President at the Children's Aid. Thank you to the Chair Mark Traeger and the Education Committee for the opportunity to testify today. For nearly 167 years, Children's Aid has been committed to ensuring that there are no boundaries to the aspirations of young people and no limits to their potential. Our over 2,000 full-time and part-time staff empowered nearly 50,000 children, youth, and, and their families in New York City. For over 25 years, Children's Aid has operated community schools with DOE and currently partners with 19 schools. During the pandemic, Children's Aid and other CBOs who are also school partners in the city's community schools initiative have been providing crucial support to students during this crisis. We have provided wellness checks, behavioral health and social emotional support sessions. We've delivered food and PPE, supported with remote learning and device access. The list goes on and includes the necessary one-to-one -one connections and programs that Chair Traeger referenced earlier that are transformational. We truly believe that community school strategy removes the barriers to learning and success and helps to build necessary bridges. And we believe that this strategy is needed now more than ever. One of the premises of this strategy is that it takes a village to raise a child and CBOs are part of that village. And as such, you can't forge a path forward without leveraging the services and supports and resources that we all offer. And yet the mayor's administration cut 9.16 million from the community schools initiative this summer. After months of outcry against the cuts, the city issued a partial one year restoration of 6 million, but the status of the program's funding for FY21 is unclear. We don't know whether we'll be starting the fiscal year with a $9 million deficit or if the upcoming RFP will have no, uh, will be affected. Despite the recent good news that the city aims to expand community schools, we still have no word on restoration of the cuts and are unsure how expansion can happen without Time restoration. Time expired. This is unsettling to CBOs, our school partners, and to the children, youth, and families we serve. We can't move forward and plan for the necessary work ahead, including the equitable learning recovery and healing that our students need and deserve, and that I posit can only happen in partnership with CBOs. We must be at the table, not only to plan, but to imagine what's possible. As a result, we recommend full restoration of these cuts because we believe that the strategy can help ensure that the pandemic does not further derail our young people's future, Students learn better when their physical and social emotional needs are met. Um, and they're dealing with many hardships this year from the pandemic and the social and racial inequities that they've experienced and witnessed. It, it, will only, uh, it will only get harder to focus on learning. Community schools largely serve the young people and communities hardest hit by COVID that are overwhelmingly lo low income and black and brown. To cut extra services and staff that support these communities right now is unconscionable. Community schools must be fully funded and invested for an equitable path to academic achievement and student success. Thank you. Thank you. Next I just wanna know very quickly, um, I hear you. I am not giving up on community schools. Amen. I'm, gonna, I'm fighting for the full restoration of them. And we need to make our case to our federal partners and state partners and, and to the mayor, all levels. Every Great. school must be a community school, but we Great. need to restore those cuts immediately. That's and right. I'm not Thank giving up so on much. that. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Sure. I appreciate that. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Abby Fernandez. Abby? I'm Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Abe Fernandez. I am Vice President of Collective Impact at Children's Aid and Director of the National Center for Community Schools. I'd like to add my thanks uh, to Chair Traeger and members of the Education Committee for the opportunity to provide testimony today. And also special thanks to the Chair for his support of community schools. 
In April 2020, after learning uh, of the total elimination of all summer camps and summer jobs programs announced by Mayor de Blasio, Children's Aid launched an effort that would later be called Recovery Lab, an initiative to mitigate the devastating effects we feared the mayor's decision would have on New York City's most vulnerable young people in summer and fall 2020. Our grave concern was the degree of setbacks too many students would face in the fall restart after six months or more of being remote and without opportunities for engaged learning and healthy social, social emotional development. 26 community-based organizations from across the city served on planning groups we convened in June and July 2020, just right before summer started and as it started, and we raised just over $6 million from private sources that were dispersed via the Robin Hood Relief Fund to 29 organizations. We are now studying the lessons learned from these organizations' recovery lab programs and will release a full report of our findings and recommendations in March 2021. In the interim, I'd like to share three of the major themes that are emerging. First, technology was both a barrier and a bridge. Too many participants struggled with access to devices and or reliable broadband, making it near impossible for them to fully engage. At the same time, some CBOs reported having greater engagement and contact with students and families remotely as compared to in-person programming the year before. Number two, flexibility leads to innovation. While Recovery Lab clearly articulated and emphasized outcomes we were hoping Time to see, grantees were provided flexibility in how to design their programs. This freed them up to be more creative and responsive to the needs of their young people. And finally, when the city stepped back, CBOs stepped up. CBOs provided services to some constituents that the city was not able to provide, often going above and beyond their organizational capacity. In closing, I want to urge that the lessons we are learning via Recovery Lab be integrated into the city's approach going forward. The opportunity to recover, that is to accelerate learning for children and youth, is here now. Our strong recommendation is that summer planning and decisions about investing in nonprofits for summer programming happen immediately, not when the school year is nearly over. Many thanks for the opportunity to submit testimony to the record. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Daryl. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Daryl Hornick-Becker, and I'm a Policy and Advocacy Associate at Citizens Committee for Children of New York. I'd like to thank Chair Traeger and all the members of the Education Committee for holding today's hearing. For a full set of recommendations, I refer you to our written testimony. Today, I'll highlight just a few areas where action is needed. First, the city must work towards more equitable live instruction. A significant disparity in live instruction has emerged in New York City this school year. According to data from the Census Bureau, September and November, between September and November of last year, black households in New York were almost three times as likely as white households to report zero days of live contact with a teacher in the past week. Hispanic households were almost twice as likely. The discrepancy in live contact is a result of many factors, but it all begins with remote access. Learning devices, hardware like keyboards and headphones, and most importantly, access to Wi-Fi, continue to warrant ongoing prioritization by the administration and the Department of Education for the remainder of the school year, no matter how many schools are offering in-person learning. Second, vulnerable student populations continue to need targeted supports and interventions. Efforts for English language learners should include grants for CBOs who work in immigrant communities, in-person or virtual system-wide offerings to help ELLs catch up, and a robust communication plan that prioritizes the way immigrant families receive information. CCC also urges the administration to take several actions to support students in temporary housing, including expediting Wi-Fi installation at shelters, immediately fulfilling any outstanding device requests, providing reliable and consistent technological support, and filling the more than 20 vacant positions dedicated to students who are homeless within the department. Lastly, the city must restore funding and prevent any future cuts to extracurricular programs that help students. Community schools, after school and summer programs have always played a pivotal role in combating learning loss, and they must be an integral part of the city's plan to enhance student achievement. Already, the mayor has proposed eliminating Sonic summer programming for middle Time school expired. students in his preliminary budget. These programs absolutely cannot sustain any cuts in funding in the current year or in the city's 2022 budget. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. This concludes this panel.
seeing that no council members have their hand raised, I will now turn into our next panel. Our next panel will be Robert Robinson from the Student Leadership Network and Sandra Shepard from WNET NY Public Media. First, we will be hearing from Robert. Time starts now. Good afternoon, all. My name is Robert Robinson. I'm the Senior Managing Director of the College Bound Initiative at Student Leadership Network, formerly known as the Young Women's Leadership Network. I'm a Brooklyn native and a proud New York City public school alumnus. Uh, shout out to Edward R. Morrow, class of 1996. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm fortunate to be in a position where I get to work uh, to increase college enrollment for first generation students from underserved communities like myself. Uh, CBI uh, has today nearly 14,000 students in 25 New York City public schools. Uh, impacted. What's our secret sauce? We place a full-time director of college counseling in the schools, much like at a private school, where students have the opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one and in small groups, large groups with this person, soup to nuts, to help them with the college application, financial aid, and enrollment process. Since 2001, we've helped more than 18,000 students enroll in college and help these same students uh, garner $736 million in financial aid, excluding loans. When our partner schools closed in March 2020, our students lost daily structure, stability, and the in-person connection for all the programming that we typically will provide for them. Many of the students had to take on jobs and additional roles to support their families. Students talked about depression, anxiety, trauma, uh, more burnout, low morale, all the things that our staff members have had to uh, you know, take heed in dealing with our students who are facing these many different things. Connectivity challenges, uh, students not having the devices, but when they got the device, not having the internet connectivity to be able to log on and get the programming services that we're able to offer to them. What we did was we quickly pivoted. We moved our services from in-person to online platforms, we're Time expired. Able to say that we've been able to continue to support our students virtually to ensure that our classes are getting what they need for the next steps and so that all our students graduating will have post secondary options. We want to thank the Department of Ed and the New York City Council for supporting us, for supporting Student Leadership Network, and, and in turn supporting the students in New York City public schools to ensure that. One day it's not a secret sauce and that every student in New York City public schools will have a dedicated college counselor to help them uh, get into college. Thank you. Thank you. Next we will be hearing from Sandra. Time starts now. Well, good afternoon, Chair Traeger and members of the Education Committee. Um, my name is Sandra Shepard and I'm the Director of Kids Media and Education at 13. We are New York's uh, PBS station. Uh, in response to COVID-19 school closures last spring, 13 quickly mobilized to produce two broadcast series for children. Let's Learn was developed in collaboration with the New York City DOE to supplement remote learning for children ages three to eight. Each program features teachers engaging viewers in learning activities focused on literacy, math, science, the arts, music, and more. Then in June, we produced Camp TV. It's a fun new broadcast series for kids ages five to 10, which aims to bolster student learning during the summer months. It's hosted by a head counselor and Camp TV features content from some of the city's best educational and cultural organizations. Now, despite the best efforts of New York City's teachers, Research tells us the pandemic has set back learning for all students, but especially for students of color. While Let's Learn and Camp TV were launched at the height of the pandemic to mitigate learning losses from school closures, the two series have, also, have, have become powerful tools to provide equitable access to unique educational enrichment opportunities. To date, Let's Learn and Camp TV have garnered nearly 1 million views, both on broadcast and online. And in closing, I want to share a brief story from a January 3rd New York Times article. Valentin Vivar is a five-year-old boy from Queens 
whose sporadic access to remote learning has been through a single iPhone he shares with his sister. Now, Valentin needs speech therapy, and he has struggled with remote Time learning. Time expired. A teacher told Valentin about Let's Learn, and Valentin began watching every day. He's engaged, and his sister reports he's been reading books by himself and is writing new words. We are making plans now to continue broadcasting Let's Learn and Camp TV during fiscal year 2022, so we can help make a difference for all children like Valentin out there. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Seeing that no council members have their hand raised, we will now turn it to our next panel, which would be Sherry Jackson from the Opportunity Charter Schools, Jeffer Jefferson Pastron from New Visions, and Am Ambry Kurashi from Education Video, Educational Video Center. First, we will be hearing from Sherry. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Traeger and the members of the Committee on Education for this opportunity to testify. My name is Cherie Jackson and I'm one of seven social workers at the Opportunity Charter School in Harlem, where I've worked for the past 12 years. OCS is an independent charter school focused on serving high needs students with disabilities in sixth to 12th grade. 63% of our students have disabilities. Providing each grade with a social worker was unheard of to me and spoke to my belief that addressing the social emotional needs of the student is as much important, if not more at times, than educating them academically. Most OCS students have heightened emotional, behavioral, and social difficulties, and through their hard work at OCS, almost every student is able to graduate. Our 2020 graduation rate for all students was 94% compared to 79% citywide. Providing high levels of social emotional support to our students has been a crucial element of the success of OCS since its founding in 2004. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, many of these emotional needs have been intensified, making the work that we do even more important. OCS social workers, trained behavior specialists, teachers, guidance teams, school psychologists, and secretarial staff all serve as mentors to support students and families to maintain connectedness. Our social workers often make themselves available to speak with families late into the evening and on the weekends, providing emotional and even academic support. While providing support individually and in groups, we are seeing increased levels of anxiety, depression, insomnia, stress-related somatic illnesses, feelings of isolation, and now Zoom dysmorphia, a stressful mental preoccupation with how one looks on Zoom and the belief that one is ugly or looks wrong, thus making it more difficult for students to engage in live lessons. We are learning that while COVID-19 did not create most of these problems, we know that it has exacerbated them and we must prepare for the long-term effects on the mental health of our students and families. Time expired. With that said, increased resources and financial support to strengthen social and emotional support services in all schools is crucial for the continued success of all of our students in the city and members of our community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, You're welcome. Next, we will be hearing from Jefferson. Good afternoon. My name is Jefferson Pestronk, and on behalf of New Visions for Public Schools, I thank Chair Traeger and the Education Committee for the opportunity to testify today. We've partnered with the Department of Education and Public School stakeholders for more than 30 years. And for the past seven years, we've built tools that help educators use data more effectively to support student success. Improvement expert Tony Breich notes that it's difficult to sustainably improve what we do not measure. This is particularly challenging during this crisis when many traditional measures of student engagement are unavailable, but it's more critical than ever to support students. We collaborate directly with schools to address challenges like this. Last spring, we worked with a small group of schools to understand how Google Classroom, which many schools were using to distribute and manage remote coursework, could help illuminate student engagement during remote learning. We identified key data points, like how frequently students were turning in assignments that painted a richer picture than just remote attendance. Incorporating these data into the portal by New Visions, a tool already available to every high school citywide, made it possible for schools to use a single tool to examine patterns of student engagement, identify which students are disengaging, 
understand why based in part on multiple other factors like whether students had access to remote learning devices or low pre-COVID attendance and plan and monitor support for students. We since partnered with nearly 300 schools to integrate this data, directly responding to requests from school leaders. Schools that gained access to this actionable information increased their use of the portal and freed from the need to build their own tools could focus on sustaining relationships with students and supporting their needs. We're only beginning to understand the impact of COVID-19 on learning, but there will be much work ahead to support every student to regain lost ground. It'll be more important than ever to empower educators with actionable data, and there's clearly a demand for it. We look forward to continued partnership with students and families, educators, the DOE, and elected officials like the Council on this critical work. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Ambering. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Ambreen Qureshi, and I'm the executive director of EVC, the Educational Video Center. Founded in 1984, EVC is a youth media and social justice organization that teaches documentary filmmaking as a means to develop the artistic, critical, literacy, and career skills of historically marginalized young people from low-income communities. Over the last 35 years, we have supported positive life and career paths for over 27,000 young people in New York City, shared our proven media arts methodology with over 15,000 practitioners, and directly trained over 1,000 teachers in our student-centered, culturally responsive pedagogy. COVID-19 has negatively impacted historically marginalized youth that we serve in so many ways. Mental health strain, uh, increased digital divide, exacerbated inequity, um, and funding cuts. Many critical youth programs and funding initiatives, including SYEP, Learn to Work, CASA, Cultural Immigrant, Digital Inclusion, and other uh, initiatives have undergone serious budget cuts, which have disproportionately impacted low-income uh, youth of color. Often our students are the sole breadwinners in their families and they rely on stipends for basic needs like food. The community, trusted relationships and social emotional learning support and structure that EVC provides are extremely critical for our students at this time. Uh, we recommend that you hear from our students directly. I've included links to four documentary films that our students have produced in our written testimony. Our students are demanding systems to support a high need students who are struggling with a variety of systemic issues. Specific recommendations could include continuing food assistance programs, public options for taxpayer funded broadband internet for New York City public school students, taxing the richest uh, in New York um, and companies and corporations here to fully fund our educational system, systems to support students after they graduated, including fully funding CUNY programs, um, culturally responsive trauma- Time expired centered pedagogy moving forward across all schools in New York City and opportunities for youth to expand their reach of social justice documentaries. Um, uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify. We look forward to working with the City Council to ensure that all young New Yorkers, particularly historically marginalized youth from low income communities, have access to services and support they need to thrive in their education and beyond. Thank you and thank you to this panel. Seeing that no council members have their hand raised, we will now call on our next panel. The next panel will be Andrea Alejandra Ortiz from the New York Immigration Coalition, Vanessa Luna from M Schools, Heidi Abreu from the Hispanic Federation, Jennifer Salgado from the community, a community organizer at Mass. Your first be hearing from Andrea. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Traeger, for your tireless support and this opportunity to testify. I'm Andrea Ortiz, Manager of Education Policy at the New York Immigration Coalition. The current public health crisis has exacerbated the inequities in the city's public school systems. English language learners continue to have the highest dropout rate at 23% of any subgroup in the city. Meanwhile, less than 4% of eligible immigrant adults have access to adult literacy programs, which have been critical for parents trying to navigate the COVID crisis and remote learning. And while our families are extremely resilient and deeply committed to their education, due to a lack of meaningful access to remote and blended learning and faulty communication, immigrant students have, been, have experienced significant gaps in their learning. Therefore, we're here to request that the city and the DOE make significant investments in the immigrant families and implement the following recommendations. 
The city and the DOE must urgently develop and implement a plan to catch up elves and students with limited English proficient parents. That includes elf summer school for students in K through 12th grade that fully incorporates students in K through second grade and elves with disabilities. It must also offer grants to community-based organizations and schools already well positioned to support elves and immigrant families, including for after school Saturday program and family engagement. It must implement and fully fund the Education Collaborative's communication plan and avoid sole reliance on online and email communication and restore and baseline 12 million for adult literacy funding so that thousands of immigrant adult learners do not lose their seats at English language programs across the city. Throughout this crisis, schools have admitted to our member organizations that they are not providing the full set of L services students are legally entitled to and that they need to, to meet their full potential. Sharing uh, the following issues. One, ENL instruction is not yet in place due to COVID. Two, there's a lack of bilingual staff to op offer pre-COVID services. Three, bilingual special education services are not available during this time. And four, they're really struggling to communicate with immigrant families. Unfortunately, many immigrant families have not been meaningfully engaged or supported to understand- Time expired. And important notifications such as requesting a device, returning to in-person learning and receiving meals and other services. It is important to note that the pandemic has been particularly difficult for immigrant families who speak languages of limited in, uh, diffusion, those with low literacy and low digital literacy, those with children who are elves with disabilities, who are undocumented, low wealth and homeless immigrant families. It is clear that across the board, immigrant students are disproportionately struggling. And we know that the New York City education system has historically been underfunded. And sadly, before and during this pandemic, the DOE has faced the decision to steal from Peter to pay Paul. But we can't keep making immigrant students the Peter in this story. The upcoming budget is a moral document and we must show that immigrant students are an important part of the New York fabric in our future. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Vanessa. Time starts now. Thank you to the Education Committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Vanessa Luna and I'm the co-founder and chief program officer of M Schools, an immigrant-led nonprofit working closely with educators and undocumented students and families in New York City public schools. Over the course of this unprecedented school year, we have witnessed the tremendous work of immigrant students, families, as well as educators and school staff. We have also witnessed the existing inequities that have been exacerbated by this moment. M Schools recommends that the New York City Council work closely with undocumented students and families and community-based organizations to urgently develop a plan of academic support for multilingual learners that centers the need of those that are undocumented and in mixed status families. We urge to have a clear communication plan that informs immigrant students and their families around opportunities, resources, and supports, regardless of immigration status. Working closely with 10 high school undocumented students and over 500 immigrant families, we have witnessed their commitment to career and educational opportunities beyond high school. But a lack of access to resources and information on their post-secondary options has been the reality in New York City public schools. All of our students, were unaware of financial aid opportunities, including the New York State DREAM Act, state and private financial assistance, and had various questions related to their status. Many referred to the fact that they went to a very large school and could not receive one-on-one -on -one support. One of our students, born in Dominican Republic and who now calls Harlem home and has a dream of becoming a doctor, shared being in a Zoom classroom with over 50 students receiving college guidance and assistance without a safe space to speak on sensitive topics such as immigration status and without one-on-one -on -one support. The college resources she received I'm expired. were only for those who are citizens, not for students like her. In addition, inconsistencies around language access have continued to occur during this moment. Many families have cited lack of translated materials and remote spaces that do not account for multiple languages. This all impacts our students' academic achievement and leave students and families to have to be extremely resilient and figure out their own pathway to success. We, can now, we cannot allow this to be the reality. While we've been able to provide this support, there are thousands of undocumented students in New York City classrooms who do not have that. As a formerly undocumented student and former documented New York City teacher, I urge you to center the needs of our immigrant students and families as you pursue educational equity in New York City public schools. 
thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Tidy. Time starts now. Thank you, council member and committee chair Traeger and all the other committee members for taking the time to listen to the testimony drafted by the Hispanic Federation, a nonprofit organization seeking to empower and advance Hispanic communities through programs and legislative advocacy. My name is Tidy Abreu and as the policy analyst for the Hispanic Federation, I'm here to advocate for Latinx students in New York City who are struggling to face the challenges that COVID-19 has posed since the full shutdown of schools mid-March 2020. It has been almost a year since our students had their academic learning interrupted and initial data shows the inequities that have been exacerbated due to the health crisis. It is clear and alarming that our students are falling behind, most specifically Latino and Black students. The pandemic has changed the, last, the landscape of NYC's educational system and highlighted the vast inequities faced by schools and students. Advocating for equitable funding is critical to providing additional resources to schools that have been most impacted by the pandemic. The Hispanic Federation recommends prioritizing most impacted schools that need additional funding by analyzing whether or not they meet or experience the following factors. Significant number of the student body has no or low engagement during remote hybrid learning. Major majority of the student body needs and utilizes school meal services. Significant number of the student body needs school laptops and internet devices to meet to participate in remote learning. Significant number of the student body is composed of multilingual learners, students who are academically at risk, low income and or students with disabilities and schools that one, identify as a struggling school or persistently struggling, and two, experience one or more of the above that I just mentioned. Moreover, we believe the following services make the greatest impact on students' educational outcomes, particularly when considering the additional needs to close the achievement gap, exacerbated by the novel- Time expired. Um, the following services include those for multilingual learners, parent engagement, socio-emotional supports, academic and transitional supports, and summer programming. Uh, for the sake of time, uh, uh, just to wrap up, we believe a continuous trajectory toward justice and fairness in education is rooted in meeting the, imme the immediate and long-term needs of our students and families. And I thank you for your time and reemphasize how critical it is to focus on these priorities for the benefit of many students and communities and in turn, the entire city. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Jennifer. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair and Council Members. My name is Jennifer Salgado and I am a community organizer at MASA, a community-based organization that works with Mexican and Latin American immigrant children youth and families in the South Bronx to develop strong le learners and leaders who fully contribute to the broader community. The testimony I am sharing today is from one of our parent leaders from Masa Padres en Acción or Masa Parents in Action, a parent-led community organizing group that focuses on improving the educational outcomes and experiences of children and families in the South Bronx, especially in District 7. My name now for testimony. My name is Ofemia Neri. I am a mother of four children, a 16-year-old teenager, two nine and six-year-old girls, and then my youngest boy who is four. My experience with the quarantine has been very difficult because we had many learning and emotional problems with my children. The oldest was an excellent student before the pandemic. I never had a complaint from the school about him, but when this disease came, change came. We all had trouble sleeping and eating, and this affected the oldest because there were times that he got up late for class, but what also hurt him was that for his classes, he had to submit work using video, and he does not like to take photos and much less videos. These things ended up affecting him a lot, and the school never called us to let us know that something was wrong. It was very stressful because we couldn't help our children as much as we would have liked. When my son's school finally came called, they told me that my child was falling behind in three subjects, which used to be easy for him. I remember that when the advisor said that he was low in three subjects, I could not believe it because my child has always been very diligent with school. I then made the decision to talk to his advisor about the issues that were happening to see how we could help him and how the school could help us, but it wasn't much. 
Meanwhile, we were also having problems with the other six- Time people. expired. She didn't want to do her homework because she said it was too much work for her and she cried before all of her classes every day. This does not take into account that it took us months to receive a tablet and therefore increased stress at home for the children and for us as parents. As you can imagine, we sometimes had to share technology among the children and there were many times where we had to work from our cell phones. Um, my husband and I were beyond stressed with the situation. I just wanna say again that the school did nothing to communicate with me and still we continue to struggle with a lot of the same issues. At this time, I would like the DOE to help us with more support for mental and emotional health for our children and for parents. In addition, it is very important that the communication streams between families and schools are improved so that families do not continue to go through what my family has experienced. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, uh, one moment, uh, Ms. Sogaro, uh, has the school communicated with you now about the, the, the needs of your children or? Um, so it's not my case, it is one of our um, parent members. Yeah. Uh, he has um, been able to now get a tablet, but again, it, it took months for her to even get in contact with the school. It took sometimes us calling the school um, to get a hold of someone. And there were many times where no one was able to get back to her. Um, so many miscommunication issues. And this is, this is just one parent. And I would just like to highlight that this happened with many other parents um, throughout the district. So, um... Feel free, uh, and my staff, I'll give you my email, mtrager at council.nyc.gov. I read my emails as soon as I have a chance to, to, to catch up with them. Uh, but this, when, when I hear of a school not getting back to a parent, when I hear a school not following up to meet the needs of kids, I, that's very personal. And that, that is an issue you can't just put on a shelf. You have to deal with it right away. So I definitely, uh, I welcome you to send over any types of cases like this to me personally, to my office, and I will follow up directly. Uh, mtrager at council.nyc.gov. Reach out to me anytime, please. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing that no council members, no other council members have their hand raised, I will now turn it to our next panel, which will be Christina Reyes from the Inwood Academy for Leadership and Reyes Claudio from Bria Public Charter Schools. First, we will be hearing from Christina. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Councilman Trigger, and for the rest of the council for allowing me to speak today. I've never done this before. It's my first time. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm uh, the CEO of Inwood Academy. We are a charter school in Uptown Manhattan. We serve 960 students, 24% of our students are L's or former L's, and 80% of our students speak a language other than English in the home, and 24% of our students have IEPs, um, a, a, a number that is larger than the district, uh, which is District 6. Um, first of all, I just wanna acknowledge everyone on this call, just listening to everyone today and the work that they're doing. It has been the most trying 11 months of our lives, and I think just hearing all the good work that everyone's doing is so encouraging to me as an educator who's been in this work for 20 years and has never faced anything like this. And we all know that we're all in this struggle together. So just thank you for everyone for sharing. Um, when we closed in March, along with all the other schools in the city, we made it a priority to ensure that our families were the priority um, at all times, our families and our children. And so. The first thing we did was made sure that we had the availability of a food supply um, and then, of course, um, Chromebooks for all of our students so that we could at least meet their basic needs. By the middle of May, all of our students who had wanted a Chromebook had been able to get a Chromebook. Um, we felt that was the priority. At that time, Wi-Fi was free. When uh, Wi-Fi was no longer free for our families, we were able to then get them hotspots. Um, we then focused on our academics, which of course, like many other schools have, um, we have made changes throughout the last 11 months to try to best support the needs of our students. We took into several um, considerations over- Time expired. 
over the summer um, to ensure that we um, were making the, the best choices for our families. And we decided to stay remote, but we did open the Family Support Center, which served um, close to 100 of our families with in-school support by pod leaders by grade level. And that was in order to ensure that the um, families who needed that childcare support were able to be supported in that way. And so I just wanna say um, one thing is that we have not as charters had access to testing. Yes, it, we do use the situation room as noted before, um, but we are, we are located in a non-DOE space, we rent space. Um, but from my understanding, my colleagues at the DOE who, who rent DOE space are not, um, who are offered DOE space, I should say, um, are not able to get testing either. And so that is something that's concerning because we are all trying to do our best with the resources we have. And so we just wanted to note that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Just a, a quick follow-up on that. Um, who, who did you speak with from the DOE when you have made requests for, for testing? Um, we have, we have asked the charter office, and at that time we were told that we did not have access to that. Um, this is true of other things like professional development and other things as well, even though we're DOE authorized school, we have not had access to those kinds of resources as a charter. And so we've had to pay all of those things, even if the DOE was offering really good professional development, we did not have access. And the same is true of the COVID testing. Um, if you would like, because I think we heard earlier testimony from the DOE that they were providing access and maybe there's some, we need some further clarification from them, but if you want to send, send me an email, uh, mtrager at council.nyc.gov, we'll, 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 we'll get answers as to what's, what's going on here, okay? Absolutely, we will. Thank you. Thank you, sure. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Reyes. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman um, and Council Members. Um, I'm very honored to be here today. My name is Reyes Claudio and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Bria Public Charter Schools. Uh, we're a network of five free public charter schools in the Bronx. Um, I am a proud Bronx native, um, a community board member. Um, I live in the South Bronx um, and I'm a Bria parent as well. Very strange to have a chief operating officer testifying today. Um, I wear a lot of hats in the jack of all trades um, and firmly believe in our community, the community that we serve. I echo Ms. Reyes in her uh, concerns. Um, I submitted a written testimony, so I won't read that word for word, uh, but in a JITS, um, we were given uh, the opportunity of a lifetime to reopen our schools, um, reinvent what schools looked like post-pandemic, um, and then the added notion of being a public charter school in a private um, you know, space. And so what that meant is that we were kind of standalone, left alone, even though we're, the, we're serving the same population, the same students with the same needs. Um, actually, just this week, we started on-site COVID testing that um, I had to personally coordinate we're paying for ourselves in order to remain open because asking for a negative result of parents they they don't have the resources um, and they don't have the time to be able to do that themselves um, when the pandemic hit we had three schools in the midst of a pandemic we opened up two more schools and moved the school um, so we're now also in district 10 um, we were serving 920 students when the pandemic started and now um, 1360 students across these two districts um, and um, there we were asked our staff to uh, be frontline workers just like everyone else um, they a lot of our families 32% um, of them are um, of uh, expired abilities and more than 90% um, of them of economically disadvantaged uh, backgrounds. Um, we also distributed Chromebooks, uh, 750 of them at the time, over 300 hotspots. Um, we've had over 90% attendance rates through the pandemic um, and um, have served our families. Um, and so thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Seeing that no council members have their hand rates for this panel, I will now call on the next panel.
which will be Edwin Cespedes char from the charter schools, Valerie Marquis Edwards from KIPP. We will first start with Edwin. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Chair and Council members and all the staff for, for organizing this hearing. My name is Edwin Cespedes. I serve on the Board of Success Academy as a parent representative. And I have to say this COVID-19 is, is it's been hard on all us New Yorkers. Uh, it's brought the city to a standstill, especially to uh, <clears throat> in an education system. For us with families with uh, school-aged children, uh, we are affected with the household res responsibilities and that is exacerbated by the school closures. Uh, but I will say that Amy, this outlook at charter schools and specifically um, Success Academy, they have been this, what I will call an oasis in, in our public education system. I have two kids, one in first grade and seventh grade. And, um, and back in March last year, uh, Success, I remember it was the first one that decided to go remote. And that was when the DOE was still debating about keeping their schools open or closed. And since then, um, Success announced that they, we were gonna have remote learning through at least March of this year. Um, so that will, rather than to extend the uncertainty of, of either remote or in person, we already know what to expect. Um, and even though we and public charter schools, we receive less funding than district schools, uh, we were able to equip all 20,000 students uh, with Chrome tables and Chromebooks and all the necessary apps <clears throat> for a full digital experience. Uh, so, and, the, and this is something that happened right away. Middle school students, they already have the Chromebooks uh, and this is before the pandemic. And in elementary schools, uh, within the two week period, we already received all the, the Chromebook tablets. So they were able to use Kami things to do math exercises digitally. We already have the libraries with tumble books, epics, Amazon audiobooks, all the sort of things of materials for them to succeed. We also have a full schedule with live instruction, five Time days. Time expired. Um, and the same teachers and the same section of students. We have electives like chess and debate. We already have um, a, a school class trips uh, virtually, obviously. And we also have free optional virtual after school programming. Um, I will say also throughout this period, the quality of teachers have been preserved. They, they have been hard working hard to maintain academic integrity. And they always focusing on what the kids are doing in class, making sure that they are actually following the material. Uh, and we as parents, we are able to see what are the performances going through with up constant updated uh, information with the grades and from the teachers itself about their behavior or things like that. And the final thing that I will say is that families are reasonably concerned about the children, not only falling behind academically, but also about the consequences of proactive separation from others. So these social gains are hard to replicate when you're not in campus, but at least when it comes to academic performance, uh, Shutter School Networks of Success have managed to create an exemplary virtual program uh, that I will say that it could be replicated and other schools can learn from. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Valerie. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Valerie Marcus Edwards. I am a founding middle school English teacher and advocacy advisor at Kip All Middle School in the Bronx's District 15. Our school educates 247 of New York City's middle schoolers and I teach English to 87 of them. As a teacher and as an advocate, I am committed to ensuring that all children and all teachers in our city, not just those with whom I work in my own community, receive equitable access to a safe learning space. In the context of this global pandemic, a safe learning space means providing all children, their families, and their teachers with a physical space to learn in which the spread or lingering threat of COVID-19 exposure and all the tribulation that comes along with that is eradicated to the best of our science and our ability. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began, <clears throat> I have lauded KIPP New York City, my employer, for ensuring that all families whom we serve have access to food, and technology necessary for remote schooling. Alongside us, the city has done very well to ensure that a testing and tracing protocol be implemented in its public schools. However, a disparity between access in district schools versus access in public charter schools to testing still exists. 
I would like to underscore that charter school students are indeed public school students. And as such, I implore that the city council please include KIPP New York City and the children and families whom we serve and the teachers and staff whom we employ in the robust testing and tracing protocols and efforts afforded to children and staff in district schools. Over the months of teaching and working remotely, I have become acutely aware that many of my students and some of my colleagues suffer from pre-existing conditions that discourage them from feeling safe returning to school buildings. Ubiquitously, scientists and lawmakers alike agree that a more robust testing system must Time be expired. to ensure safe reopening. Mayor Bill de Blasio has spoken about this before, in fact. The growing body of science and evidence that exists around the globe, particularly in Europe, where countries like Germany and France were able to keep their schools safely open with staff and students and parent testing protocols, supports the mayor's insistence on testing within our public schools as a necessary action for ensuring health and safety in our community. I appreciate your time and consideration. And in conclusion, I urge the city council to enact and enforce basic equitable public health practices that protect my students, their families, our communities, and me from further devastation. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing that no council members have their hand raised, I will now call on the next panel. The next panel will be Gregory Binder, Brinder from the Daycare Council, Mark Marino from USS, and Sean Garnett Evan. We will start with Gregory. Time starts now. Gregory, is your mic on? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, our uh, 93 members currently operate uh, 216 programs, most of which are working under contracts with DOE. As early childhood educators, daycare council members engage families at the crucial earliest stages of their child's development. The first years of a child's life are the only opportunity to provide them with the social emotional development and early skills development that supports them throughout their education and throughout their lives. As such, daycare council and its network of community-based early childhood educators have long recognized that access to strong and stable early childhood education programs has profound effects on students' learning and their academic achievements. Mm -hmm. um, however, as you know, uh, the rapid changes required um, to both the program models and the funding models that have come about with COVID-19 are unprecedented. And at the same time, community-based organizations um, a role in providing support to students achievement has increased dramatically. This has included uh, launching of emergency child care centers alongside the uh, regional enrichment centers, the development of remote programming options, which is a particular challenge in early childhood, not just due to the lack of options, but also due to dealing with young children who often wouldn't have the same level of uh, literacy with computers. Um, and then um, <clears throat> opening learning bridges most recently uh, with very short uh, time period. Um, we want to recommend that the city ensures as part of its work to maintain academic achievement to do as much as it can to maintain the stability of the early childhood sector because during COVID we are facing dramatic instability. Uh, the first of this is for contracted programs we urge the city to maintain full funding based on contract value, not on enrollment, because we recognize that enrollment at this point is um, artificially low due to very factors of uh, parents having um, either staying at home or fearing for health, um, as well as issues with the DOE's um, centralized enrollment system moving slowly. And I see my time is wrapping up. So the other access- Time expired. Just one other quick point, uh, we also want to gu guarantee that community-based programs have access, e equity and access to health and safety protocols, which includes on-site nurses, professional cleaning, training around health and safety protocols, and incentive pay for staff who put their own health at risk like coming in during uh, closures. And thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Mark. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Marino, and I want to thank the Education Committee and Chair Treyer for uh, allowing me to speak. Um, I am the Director of Curriculum and Instruction for uh, University Settlement. 
Uh, we've been around for 134 years. We service over 40,000 youth and seniors. Um, we provide educational support, mental health, early childhood education, youth and community services. So our, the, the smaller, um, Lower East Side and Brooklyn. Um, so just, I just want to speak to what I've heard. I, I don't, like a lot of people, as I've been listening, um, there's some common threads that I just want to speak to that a lot of people have been talking to. So the challenges we face in our space, we do after school um, and provide like summer camp. Uh, we do learning labs, which is kind of like a support system for uh, families that um, need childcare for their young people while they go to work. So just, I would say three things that I've just heard some common threads. One is definitely, we are in the midst of an educational crisis for our young people. Like, I mean, just from what I'm hearing, it's the truth. Um, we have, we don't have the necessary access to the technology that our young people need in order to be successful. Um, we are working in diverse, underserved, um, disenfranchised communities um, that needs to be addressed. Uh, I would also say, especially for myself, and I'm speaking as a parent and an educator that I've been doing this for 25 years, is the the ability to address the the, the need no, for our expired. All right, I'll speak now. So my, my last piece is just, I just wanna know what the long-term commitment could be towards this still maintaining these essential services. Ms. Levine um, mentioned like summer programming. So how do we close the gap? Like as an after-school program, after-school provider, we are there to support people who are in the classroom day to day. We need to maintain that. So I thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next panelist will be Sean. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Shawina Garnett Evans, and I'm a Head Start assistant teacher, as well as a parent of three scholars who attend Uncommon Schools. Thank you for the opportunity to share my testimony with you today. I want to share how COVID-19 has impacted the education of children and the staff that serve them. At the start of the pandemic, no one knew what to expect. My Head Start Center closed, but fortunately, I was able to work at a regional enrichment center. This was a center for the children of first responders and essential workers. Even though our students' parents were highly exposed, we were fortunate to have a COVID-19 free site for six months of operation due to the diligent staff at the center. I'm currently back at Head Start, which is remote only because our building is not yet clear to open. Being remote only is hard, especially for such young children because I think they need hands-on teaching. Being a parent, on the other hand, proved to be a lot more difficult. I fear for my children every day, working on the front lines with my students and also making sure that my children are safe is a delicate balance. My number one concern was safety because of a COVID-19 death at one of our co-located schools, which hits close to home. Loss of life due to this virus is concerning because staff and students share the same entrances, staircases, bathrooms, ventilation, and sometimes floors. This is why I, along with many other parents, are confused as to why charter schools were not included in testing and tracing to protect all that share the same space. The layer of safety and protection that testing and tracing offers should not exclude people that share so many common spaces. We have to show grace for one another because this virus has shown us no mercy. Uncommon is doing what they can to persevere and continue to educate their students throughout this pandemic. And I, as a parent, I will do all that I can to support my children and keep them safe. In-person instruction, as what is best, no matter the age or grade of the child. I can tell you firsthand that my children miss and need it, and as a parent, so do I. But it has to be safe, responsible, and equitable. All Time schools need fine. equitable support, resources, and funding as well. I'm asking that the city council does all that they can to ensure that all children in all schools have what they need so that we can all reopen safely. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing that no council members have their hand raised, I'd like to acknowledge that this was our final panel.
if we inadvertently miss anyone that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you in the order your hand is raised. Seeing none, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. I would also like to remind everyone one last time that written testimony can be submitted to testimony at council.nyc.gov. I will now give you much time. I will now turn it to Chair Traeger for some closing remarks. I want to begin by thanking Kalima for doing a phenomenal job uh, helping policy, moderate, you name it, a jack of all trades. Thank you, Kalima, for your guidance, for your leadership and your partnership. Thank all the council staff. Uh, I want to just acknowledge the staff that we have, both my staff in my office and the council staff work really hard to prepare for hearings and then debrief afterwards to get answers, to push for action on behalf of our students and our school communities. I want to thank all of the students and educators, uh, school leaders, parents, advocates who testified today uh, because we, we're not going to go back, we're moving forward and we need to now shape uh, what that looks like and centering the needs of our kids, particularly kids who have been historically underserved. That's, that's the center right now, keeping our kids safe, but also meeting their needs. And I thank everyone for your time and thank the entire council staff, Sergeant at Arms, everyone for your partnership making today's hearing possible. Thank you all. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Chair Traeger. We will now end the live stream.